This is Director Hampson. I am now calling the March 24th, 2021 regular board meeting to order at 3.30 p.m. This meeting is being recorded. We would like to acknowledge that we are on the ancestral lands and traditional territories of the Puget Sound Coast Salish, Coast Salish people. Ms. Wilson-Jones, the roll call, please. Director DeWolf. Present. Director Harris. Present. Director Hersey. Director Hersey. Director Hersey, I can see you. See you there. Yeah, switching over from Zeams, from Zeams, from Teams to Zoom. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Cool. Director Rankin. Here. Director Rivera Smith. Present. And Director Hampson. Here. Superintendent Juno is also joining us for today's meeting and additional staff will be briefing the board as we move through the agenda. <clears throat> as we begin this meeting, I would also like, like to welcome Lemanuel Donaldson and Trayvon Mitchell, who are joining us today as the student representatives from the Student Leadership Council for the Office of African American Male Achievement. We will be hearing from them later on in the meeting, as well as fellow Student Leadership Council member August P. Diggs, who will be leading off our testimony list. This meeting is being held remotely, consistent with the governor's proclamation on open public meetings. The public is being provided remote access today by phone and through SPS TV by broadcast and streaming on YouTube. To facilitate this meeting, I will ask all participants to ensure you are muted when you are not speaking. Staff may be muting participants to address feedback and ensure we can hear our directors and staff. The first item of business on today's agenda is the appointment of school board director for the unexpired term for District 4. I want to thank candidates Aaron Dury, Laura Marie Rivera, and Eric Sousa for your participation in this appointment process and interest in serving on the board. The executive committee discussed the process that will be used for this action item during the committee's February 10th meeting and determined that the process will be as follows. First, each director will have an opportunity to speak to the one candidate they are recommending. We will move alphabetically by last name, beginning with Director DeWolf. Once each director has stated their recommendation, staff will conduct a roll call vote. This vote will be taken in reverse alphabetical order, beginning by last name, beginning with Director Rivera Smith. If one candidate receives four votes, then that candidate will be appointed as the director for District 4 having secured the required majority. If no candidate receives four votes, I will make a new motion to put before the board those candidates that received the most votes in the prior round of voting or in the event of a tie, we will re-vote on the, sorry, in the event of a tie, we will re-vote on the full slate of candidates without a new motion. We will continue voting in rounds until one candidate receives the required four vote majority. The order in which directors vote will reverse with each round. We will now begin with a motion and a second to place the three candidates before, by, the, by a second, um, a motion and then a second to that motion to place the three candidates before the board for voting. I now move that the board take up for consideration and debate the candidacies of the three candidates for the unexpired term for the director for District 4, Aaron Dory, Laura Marie Rivera, and Eric Sousa to be followed by a vote of the directors. Second. We will now start with Director DeWolf speaking to their one re recommended candidate. Director DeWolf. Thank you, President Hampson. Can you hear me okay? Yes, it's not loud, but I can hear you. Thank you, just wanted to make sure. I know I, my Wi-Fi in my house is wonky sometimes. Uh, I also wanted just to um, give my gratitude to uh, the candidates who signed up and the candidates who remain. Um, you know, as I watched the 
this, our youth led forum uh, a week ago now and and then watched the forum put on by the Seattle Council PTSA. Um, you know, one thing I just felt was um, at the end of the day, the fact that you candidates came forward, put your name forward, um, is a huge deal. And I, I don't want to let the moment go without sharing my extreme and immense gratitude I have for you because um, signing up to be part of this work, uh, knowing that it's all volunteer, knowing that um, it comes with a lot of work, uh, a lot of sacrifice. Uh, I really appreciated that you you continue to stay in this um, and to volunteer your time and your talents and your efforts with Seattle Public Schools. So I just want to make sure you all know that that is a huge deal, um, at least to me. Um, so in watching the forums, I was really compelled um, by a lot of our candidates. Um, but I think the, the candidates stuck out to me most, both based on their answers and also their grasp of the issues that I care deeply about when it comes to syst systemic transformation, racial equity, centering students, operational needs, and just an overall understanding of the district and our current work and our current um, uh, values and our, and our pursuits, particularly as this board. The candidate that I uh, would like to put forward or, or recommend um, or support tonight is uh, Aaron Dury. So to, the all, to all the others, I greatly, greatly, greatly appreciate you, as I said. Um, and so I'll turn it back over to you, President Hampson. Thank you. Um, and then we are going in alphabetical order by last name, um, which has uh, me coming up next. And um, I will just uh, echo Director DeWolf in stating my tremendous appreciation for those that put your um, your your foot forward, your your mind and your heart forward to uh, to consider doing this work. None of us. Uh, actually ran for office or um, or made this commitment in the in the height of a pandemic and yet you've all done that and I think that that shows um, at, at this very very difficult time in education in general um, an incredible amount of uh, dedication and and heart and bravery and so thank you to um, each of you uh, that remains um, today, but also thank you to those that um, participated prior to this, uh, particularly to uh, Mark Perry, who just recently um, withdrew his candidacy. He, he, his participation in the forums and in the process um, was greatly appreciated, um, but also to those who um, considered and then and then pulled out early. It's um, I, I don't want anybody to have any shame about having considered it and then decided that it, it wasn't for you at this time. It is a very massive commitment. Um, and so to those of you that are that are still standing, I really appreciate having spent time with each of you. And as I said, the level of commitment that it takes to put your um, yourself and your and, and that of your families forward at this time, I think is um, to be commended. And I've had the opportunity to speak with each one of you, um, to see you in in the forums, to um, watch your videos and, and look at your backgrounds. And um, while you each have very uh, um, strong qualifications and um, characteristics um, in terms of the, the balance and the um, direction that we're headed as a board, um, particularly with some strong background in uh, budgeting and change management, um, I'm going to um, say that, that I will be putting my support behind um, Erin Dury at this time. I was particularly impressed with her areas of expertise and um, believe um, in particular with her familiarity um, with the, uh, the students that are in foster care through her CASA experience, that she's got a great deal of understanding about students that um, exist at the margins of our systems. Uh, and, and that's a really critical level of experience that I would like to see us have on the board. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to uh, Director Harris. Um, I'm sorry I'm coming third because my two colleagues that spoke before me said many of the things that I wish to have said, so I will not repeat them. I will say, however, that uh, the fact that Erin Dury um, comes from an option alternative school 
is very important to me. I will say that her CASA background and my background in the legal community uh, makes that especially relevant and personal to me. Um, the community outreach and change management is especially important to me, as well as is uh, my conversation with Mark Perry, who had my vote previous to his uh, withdrawing for personal reasons, and he has every right to those personal reasons, and I respect him even more now for recognizing what an enormous commitment this happy job is. And um, he says he's going to continue to help us, and I'm thrilled beyond that. And to everyone that put their hat in the ring, whether they withdrew or not, huge thanks and gratitude. We know where you live, and we will find a spot for you to continue to help us if you are not appointed the director. But, but my vote will enthusiastically go for Aaron Drury. Thank you. Uh, director Hersey. Thank you very much. Um, as many of you know, oh, that is my teaching camera. Give me a second to get that figured out. I'll figure it out on the next one. Um, but as many of you know, I was sitting in this seat uh, a little over a year ago, and I it is not lost on me how much time, energy, commitment, and, and just frankly, passion, and all the anxiety as well around putting yourself forward in a way that is very public and in times can be very divided and divisive. Um, and that is no small feat. Uh, I, I think as we enter a period of transition, um, both in our leadership and, and into physical buildings, uh, having folks that are interested in jumping aboard this, this steaming bullet train um, is just very heartening. I, I think that as I think about everything that I've learned and everything that I have needed to know in this role, um, I'm really excited about candidate Dury for, for a number of reasons that have already been stated here tonight. Um, I think that the ability of all candidates who put their name forward to hit the ground running would be there, but with the special attention and focus, as Director Hampson has already mentioned, to students who live and students who frankly thrive in the margins of our society and what it's going to take for us to take those students and their experiences and put them at the forefront as we continue to figure our way out through this pandemic. Um, I'm really excited about her candidacy for so many reasons, but the style of leadership and those lived experiences that are shared between so many of our students are, are going to be critical as we make sure that we reopen in an equitable way. So I'm very excited to put my uh, support behind candidate Dury, and I'll pass to the next director. Okay, Director Rankin. Hi, thank you. Um, yeah, I also want to express my my gratitude and appreciation to uh, everybody who put their names in the hat. Um, I felt really fortunate during um, the process that uh, we had a lot of really good options. <laughs> um, uh, uh, that was really um, uh, comforting and honestly a little bit surprising going into this, knowing the circumstances that um, we're all facing right now in the challenging situation and the fact that, um, you know, the, the four and the four who ended up being in it till close to the end, now three, um, that stuck with it would, would all serve our board and serve our students really well. Um, uh, I really appreciated uh, Mark Perry's um, experience as a principal and a building leader. And given that we are a relatively young board, um, that in particular, just life experience also, and, um, and being within several, um, several systems as a, as a leader was, was really, um, appealing. So I do hope that he will continue to engage with us and, um, support the work of the board. Um, and, uh, let's see what, who's next, uh, uh, Eric Souza. Uh, the enthusiasm and willingness to dive right in and start digging into issues 
um, was also so appreciated. And um, for uh, Laura Marie, your care and and concern and and wanting every student to succeed is so evident. And that that also that moves me a lot and means a lot to me. Um, and in of us, so in the end, where we are, I'm I'm also recommending uh, Aaron Dory for this seat, due to as as other directors have noted, um, in thinking about where there are where there are overlaps, where there are gaps in skill set or um, or less less represented skills within the board that could be filled by one of these folks this is who I saw filling those particularly with um, budgeting and, and systems change and nonprofit experience was in Erin. Um, and so uh, and in addition to her focus on students um, who have been marginalized and um, need need our full attention. So I'm also recommending Erin Dury for this seat. And Director Rivera Smith. Hi, thank you. Um, so likewise, I first and foremost want to thank um, all eight candidates who stepped up to be considered for this role. And beginning there was eight. Um, so including so those who stepped down even, I respect their decisions and the foresight they had to make that decision. Um, so then there were three. And I had the pleasure of speaking with each candidate to learn more about them and to share a little bit about this job. Um, they each impressed me um, with their dedication to service and their sort of outsider insights that we unfortunately lose when we take a seat on this board. Um, and we, we become accustomed to operating from an insider position. Personally, I think some of my best moments are when I'm able to recapture um, what it's like to sit in the audience, unburdened by the politics and the reticence um, and solely focus on the issues and with the critical questions and insights that are really needed in this district. So um, they each have that and they each, you know, bring, we're gonna bring that to this job. Um, so which candidate is um, best brings that for district four and for our district as a whole? I don't know that any of us can truly know the answer to that in this short timeline. This was a really quick process and it was a timeline established by state law. So um, that's how, that's why it was such a quick Turn around here, but um, I do take solace that um, the voters will have a say in this coming up soon here um, this summer and in the fall, so they will get to decide who will fill this position in the long run. Um, but as it's our duty to appoint someone to this role starting tonight and for the next eight months, and while I think we'd be lucky to have any of the three, um, as Director Rankin mentioned, the qualities of each candidate that they would bring to this role. Um, I, I feel confident in selecting candidate Aaron Derry for this position. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Wilson-Jones, will you call for the vote? Yes, and it's just going to take me a moment to get that all on the screen properly. Uh, Dir Director Rivera-Smith. Derry. Director Rankin. Dury. <clears throat> Excuse me, Aaron Dury. Director Hersey. Dury. Director Harris. Ms. Aaron Dury. Director Hampson. Dury. And Director DeWalt. Dury. The vote is six votes for Aaron Dury for the appointment. Thank you, Ms. Wilson Jones. And while I scroll, the newly appointed director for District 4 is Aaron Dury. Congratulations and welcome to the school board. The newly appointed director will now immediately take the oath of office with Superintendent Juneau, after which, after which our new board director will then have the opportunity to give a few remarks. Is Aaron on? Ms. Deary? Deary? Yes. 
congratulations. And we're going to take the oath of office, so it's on the screen. Um, if you want to raise your hand, you can. Um, I, your name. I, Aaron Dury. Do, do hereby solemnly swear. Do hereby solemnly swear. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of Washington. And the Constitution of the State of Washington. Promote the interests of education. Promote the interests of education. And will faithfully discharge the duties of Director of Seattle School District Number 1. And will faithfully discharge the duties of Director of Seattle School District Number 1. King County, State of Washington. King County, State of Washington. To the best of my ability. To the best of my ability. Welcome, Director Deary. Thank you. Should I speak now or is there a transition? Yeah, or forever hold your peace, yeah. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm not very quick to the trigger, but yes, I now invite Director Dury to offer a few brief remarks. Um, thank you. And I want to say thank you to all who participated in the forums and the process of this appointment, in particular the NAACP Youth Council and the Seattle Council PTSA for hosting the community forums, and to all the directors for your thought process and words this evening. I am honored and grateful to serve District 4 in the Seattle Public Schools. I recognize the privilege and position of power this appointment has and know that true service will be shown through action and centering community voice particularly those who historically and currently do not have the access to have their voice heard. I know there is a lot of work to do and reconstruction to happen. I look forward to working within the community, particularly those most affected by the decisions of the board and the district. We have an opportunity to reimagine education and center the urgency of that new vision. I am ready to do the work and I am here in service. Thank you. Apologies for the delay. Again, congratulations, Director Dury. We welcome you as a member of the school board and welcome your participation as we move throughout tonight's agenda. Um, this is how we do it. You um, get voted in and um, and you, you start voting yourself. So I'm now gonna turn it over to Superintendent Juneau for her comments. Okay, thank you. Um... Uh, Superintendent, you know, you sound very far away. If there's any way you could get. Okay. I am super far away. <laughs> it's a little better. I don't mean just across it, town. I got it. I got it. Is it a little better? <laughs> it's a little better. Yeah. Okay. So, um, thank you, President Hampson. Hello, directors. Um, first, um, congratulations, Director Dury. You are joining Seattle Public Schools at a very interesting and critical time. But thank you for raising your hand to join leadership as we continue to tackle so many challenges. And we also get to celebrate successes now and again. It is a great organization filled with great people and look forward to working with you. Also want to welcome our young kings, Lemaniel, Trayvon and August. It's always good to hear from you and to learn from you. Um, thanks for joining the board meeting this evening. Last week, Seattle Public Schools and the Seattle Education Association came to a tentative agreement that supports a safe return to school buildings for all preschool, K-12 special education intensive service pathways and all kindergarten to fifth grade students. Um, as a reminder, the tentative agreement must be approved by SEA and their members began voting already and their voting will end on Friday. And as you know, the bar on this tentative agreement is on tonight's agenda for your approval as well, Board of Directors. If approved, I look forward to welcoming back preschool students and students enrolled in elementary special education intensive service pathways on Monday, March 29th, and middle and high school students enrolled in intensive service pathways and all other K-5 general education students on April 5th. We are continuing to work with SEA to come to an agreement to bring middle and high school students back to classrooms 
including sixth through eighth grade students attending K-8 schools. Last Friday, kindergarten through fifth grade families received an enrollment survey and an opportunity to choose between half-day in-person learning or 100% remote. Just a reminder to our families, we're making a big last push um, that the deadline for returning the survey is today, 11.59 p.m. Um, on Mar today, Wednesday, March 24th. Um, we know this is an important personal decision for families and students, and there really are no easy choices. There are no right or wrong choices. And we also recognize that this is a quick turnaround. The governor's order to immediately bring back all pre-K um, five by April 5th significantly impacted our timelines. We had been working in partnership with SEA to thoughtfully bring back students who need in-person learning, preschool and intensive service pathway students first, followed by other students in a phased approach. SPS is the largest district in the state, um, and we are now working to respond as quickly and that as nimbly as possible. Much of our final planning is dependent on sur survey results, including teacher assignments and your students' individual schedule. We need to know how many students are returning to each classroom as soon as possible in order to match teachers, students, and our space in our buildings. One thing that may not have been super clear during yesterday's virtual town hall was the question about whether you can switch to remote or hybrid later in the year. So just for clarity, once you make a decision regarding the learning model that meets your child's need, you will need to remain in that same model through the end of the year. So no changing. Throughout this pandemic, the health and safety of our students, staff and families continues to be our top priority. We have followed local, state, and federal health guidelines in our planning. We have inspected and repaired all HVAC systems and buildings to make sure we're meeting air quality and ventilation requirements in each classroom. And in fact, the board has a bar tonight to buy HEPA filters for schools that need it. Um, before we return to buildings, staff will be placing door signage to show when rooms were last checked and when the next maintenance might be scheduled. Um, occupancy of classrooms with appropriate distancing and that the room meets public health guidelines. Building walkthroughs have been happening. They continue to happen all across our district to make sure our buildings meet the rigorous health and safety standards necessary. We've also distributed personal protective equipment or PPE for staff and students across the district. If you would like to view what preparations are done or are in progress for your school building, check out the building readiness charts on our website. I also wanna thank our partners at the city of Seattle University of Washington, <clears throat> Seattle Cancer Care Alliance, and Seattle Indian Health Board. Around 1,000 thousand of our staff members have been uh, vaccinated at clinics that were prioritized for SPS staff, thanks to their partnership. This is a big step forward towards protecting the health of our staff, students, and community. And thousands more staff have been vaccinated through other health providers as well. So thank you to everybody involved with that. Second, I want to provide transparency around childcare in our buildings. At this time, we cannot guarantee that childcare will be available in our elementary school buildings. We know that childcare is a critical support for many families, particularly as you decide whether you choose for your child to return to in-person or to stay remote. However, with a safe return to in-person learning, following public health guidance for small cohorts and physical distancing, there may be changes to childcare. Um, this will be depend again on how many families choose to send their child back to in-person. But we continue to work closely with our child care partners to limit those impacts and we'll share more information as soon as we can. Third, we've received a lot of questions about where students will eat meals and snacks during the school day. Our pre-K through fifth grade students will be um, learning on a half day schedule or they will be learning remotely. Meals will still be available Monday through Friday by bus routes and meal sites across our districts as they have been. And students attending in-person will also have access to grab and go lunches. Students will not eat meals in the classroom except for preschool and Head Start, which is a federal and state requirement. Finally, I know that many families are concerned about how their students will get to and from school. And while at this time, we cannot guarantee transportation options for families to return to in-person, we will continue to work with our partners for student to increase the number of routes available. 
The governor's March 15th order, in addition to the half-day in-person instructional model agreed to with the Seattle Education Association, did not leave the transportation team enough time to rebuild routes and our bus contracted to hire and train the drivers that we all need. Um, to serve students at the same standards as before the pandemic and to follow additional bargained agreements, we would need around 400 buses. And as of March 18th, about half the number of required bus drivers were available. We recognize and we're deeply concerned about the inequities created for our students and families during our pandemic response, especially those furthest from educational justice. To initially address this and keep school start and end times consistent, buses were prioritized for students that we are legally obligated to provide transportation for and those most vulnerable. We know these efforts did not go far enough for students who need it most. That's why we're increasing transportation for as many students as possible, but this will require a change to elementary and K-8 school start and end times. That's also on the agenda today. And if approved by the school board, elementary and K-8 schools will start at 8 a.m. for students in remote and hybrid in-person learning starting March 29th. This 30 minute adjustment will allow more students to participate in in-person learning and to access transportation. We're asking everyone to adjust just a little so that we can serve more students that need and want in-person learning. It's been over a year since we had to close our buildings and I, along with many of our students, family and staff are eager to safely reopen our doors to be reunited with friends, classmates, teachers and students in person. In addition to our return to buildings this spring, staff are working and the board is working really diligently as well on plans for summer school and next fall. And look, we all look forward to sharing more information on that soon. And then finally, as a, a quick look at public comment tonight, shows that there are concerns from educators and community members about potential dual language staffing cuts and dual language Spanish course cuts at Mercer International Middle School. I appreciate the advocacy that our community keeps bringing to, uh, to our attention. And so thank you for being here. Uh, and please know that despite the funding challenges that Mercer and Seattle Public Schools face, we remain committed to ensuring that students at Mercer have access to a dual language Spanish program. The curriculum assessment and instruction team, including Dr. Thad Williams, has been working regularly with Principal Waters and the staff at Mercer to figure out the best way forward for this program. Specifically, we understand that a dual language best practice is to offer two courses in the language. For example, a Spanish literacy course and social studies in Spanish at each grade level. SPS staff um, is working with Mercer administration to problem solve different approaches to ensure we are able to follow more closely this dual language best practice, both in the short term and the long term. With respect to the long term, we're also excited to start working with the Mercer community to develop criteria that ensure the dual language program is prioritizing our English learner families. In addition to being consistent with our goals for racial equity and focus on students of color furthest from educational justice, we believe this approach can also help us provide more sustainable funding for this program. Regardless of the details, there will be a dual language Spanish program at Mercer in 2021-22, and it will include a focus on Spanish literacy and opportunities for students to continue developing Spanish language and literacy. We'll continue to work across all of our schools to improve our system-wide approach to dual language programming to provide more predictability. So just wanted to clear that up um, so people hear it um, directly from me. So thank you, President Hampson and Board of Directors. Thank you so much, Superintendent Juno, for that thorough uh, set of comments. And um, so I know we have um, student comments and I believe we are hearing um, I believe Trayvon was not able to join us, but we are going to hear from uh, Lee Manuel Donaldson, um, a junior at Rainier Beach High School. Uh, Trayvon Mitchell was going to join us. He's a sophomore at Cleveland High School, and I hope he'll be able to join us um, possibly the next time. Um, so these are students from our African American Male Achievement Student Leadership Council. And with that, I will turn it over to you, uh, Lee Manuel.
Hi, my name is uh, Lemania Donaldson. I attend Rainier Beach High School, where I'm a proud Viking. I currently serve in the AAMA in the Student Leadership Council, uh, and I'm also a leading member in the PLUS program. Today, I'll be talking about the Student Leadership Council and all the doors is open for me. I chose to be a part of the PLUS program in the Student Leadership Council because inequities aren't adding up in our education system. There has been a huge disproportionality in our resources and outcomes. In 2017, only 40% of Black third graders were proficient in math. In the same year, 78 white third graders were proficient in math. Why is the gap so big? We know there is no such thing as broken children, only broken systems. Why do we continue to blame the children when we, the obvious problem is the system? Why is the system struggling? More importantly, what can we do to fix the system? Lao Tzu once stated that if you do not change the direction you are going, you may end up where we are headed. Without groups like AAMA and the Student Leadership Council, we were headed toward a dark era of generational oppression. SOC gives us a voice and uncovers the truth. Prior to me joining the PLUS program, the name was Secondary Learning, Secondary Laboratory Pedagogies. Needless to say, it doesn't add up to students. We change it to PLUS because it all has to add up to students first. Our voice matters. My voice matters. When we come together, great things can happen. I'm so proud to be a part of a group that has changed their uh, systemic racism. Thank you. Thank you so very much for those comments. And please uh, feel free to stay and continue to be part of the um, meeting and uh, make comments at any time. We have now reached the public testimony portion of the agenda. I would. Uh, we will be taking public testimony by teleconference today as stated on the agenda. For any speakers watching through SPS TV, please call in now to ensure you are on the phone line when your name is called. Board procedure 1430 BP provides the rules for testimony and I ask that speakers are respectful of these rules. I will summarize some important parts of this procedure. First, testimony will be taken today from those individuals called from our public testimony list and if applicable, the waiting list, which are included on today's agenda posting on the school board website. Only those who are called by name should unmute their phones and only one person should speak at a time. Speakers from the list may cede their time to another person when the list, listed speaker's name is called. The total amount of time allowed will not exceed two minutes for the combined number of speakers and time will not be restarted after the new speaker begins. In order to maximize opportunities for others to address the board, each speaker is allowed only one speaking slot per meeting. If a speaker cedes time to a later speaker on the testimony list or waiting list, the person to whom time was ceded will not be called to provide testimony again later in the meeting as there is only one speaking slot per person. Those who do not wish to have time ceded to them may decline and retain their place on the testimony or wait list. Finally, the majority of the speaker's time should be spent on the topic they have indicated they wish to speak about. Ms. Wilson-Jones will read off the testimony speakers. Thank you, President Hampson. A quick logistical note, um, speakers, please remain muted until your name is called to provide testimony. When your name is called, please be sure you have unmuted on the device you are calling from and also press star six to unmute on the conference call line. Each speaker will have a two minute speaking time and a chime will sound when your time is exhausted and the next speaker will then be called. The first speaker on today's testimony list is August P. Diggs. Um, good afternoon. My name is August Diggs. I'm an eighth grader at Denny International Middle School and a proud member of the Student Leadership Council of the AAMA. Today, I will be discussing growth, prospect, process, and change. First, I just want to thank you all for having me and thank you all for being a part of this growth and change. You are affecting my life and the future generation positively. Um, sadly, black lives haven't always mattered in Seattle Public Schools. According to Seattle Public Schools outcome data table, there were 11.4% of African-American males getting suspended 
compared to the 2.3% of white males in 2014. That's five times the amount. This table is cool and all, but in my eyes, I see everyone is equal. But the sad truth is, there's implicit bias, systemic racism, and oppression, which is why I'm proud to be a part of this uh, Student Leadership Council. We're fighting to change this. We've been a part of the grading policy reform, return to school schedule models, and disciplinary action panels, and so much more. In the end, I want to feel important. I want teachers to support us in our dreams, to educate us in the classroom and be our friends outside of it, to call us in the classroom instead of kicking us out, to treat us like people instead of, uh, instead of continuing this racism. I'm honored to be a part of this movement. Remember, nothing about us without us. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Mr. Diggs. And again, thank you to Mr. Donaldson as well uh, for both of your inspiring words. Um, Ms. Wilson-Jones, the uh, next speaker, please. Next is Dahlia Gomez. Dahlia Gomez. Hi. Go ahead, we can hear you. National Law School. Okay, go ahead. Hi, my name is Dahlia Gomez. I'm a sixth grade student at Mercer International Middle School. I want to talk to you today because my school has decided to make cuts to the Spanish Immersion Program next year. The Spanish Immersion Program is important to me and my family and to a lot of other kids and their families. Having this program is important to me because it is a way for me to be able to practice and learn in my native language, to be around people who are a part of my culture, and to be with people, people that also have the same love for the program as I do. If my school decides to go through with the cuts to the program, it will deny native speakers the opportunity to keep practicing and learning in their native language. If the school makes cuts to the program, it will mean, would mean that I would not get as much practice speaking Spanish, my dad's preferred language. This would mean that it would make it harder for me to communicate with him and other members of my family who only speak Spanish. In the future, I hope to be fully bilingual so I can pass on my Mexican heritage and be able to one day give back to my community by being able to help others who prefer or, or only speak Spanish. Making cuts to the program would hurt me and other students. I wish Mercer would, Mercer would have taken into consideration how this would affect the students and families in the Spanish Immersion Program. I hope you take this matter seriously and we consider making these cuts to the Spanish Immersion Program. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Dahlia. Ms. Wilson-Jones. Next is Samuel Ivan Mendoza Gilbert. Samuel Ivan Mendoza Gilbert. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, thank you. Um, hello, my name is Samuel. I am a sixth grader at Mercer International School and I have a few points to make. It has come to my attention that the school will be cutting some of the Spanish immersion classes. This worries me a lot because as a Latinx student, Spanish is part of my identity. If I can't speak Spanish or only know sixth grade level of Spanish, that's like not having part of my identity with me. I um, I identify with Spanish, I don't just speak it, and it, it is the language of my ancestors. Another thing that worries me is that if we can't take the stamp test when we were, when we are in sixth grade and can only take it in seventh and eighth, how are we supposed to learn more Spanish in seventh and eighth to be able to pass the stamp test? Passing the test to be able to get high school credit in middle school is very important. Is very important to me since I want to study in engineering and get a deg degree in mechanical engineering. It is also important to other kids in my grade, I am sure, so that they can get a good job in the future. I have also been studying Spanish in Seattle Public Schools since kindergarten, and when I was studying Spanish for these six years, I expected that I would be able to continue studying it through middle school. In fact, that is the reason I came to Mercer. Being in the Spanish immersion class is felt like that the school was supporting my identity as a Latin as a Latinx student. Thank you for listening and I hope you will consider the points I've made. Thank you, Samuel. Ms. Wilson Jones. 
Next is Chris Jackins. Chris Jackins. My name is Chris Jackins, Box 84063, Seattle 98124. On the six action items, two points. Number one, I wish to thank Superintendent Denise Juno for her work for Seattle Public Schools. Also, welcome to the new board director. Number two, when the report on the agreement with the SEA was posted last Friday, the report did not discuss the effects on in-person learning. On the resolution for funding Kimball, Northgate, and Vulans, the district wants to demolish these schools and shrink their play areas. Please vote no. On board policy 6220 and three school projects, four points. Number one, at West Woodland, $1 million to get extra new furniture. Number two, at Rainier Beach, $500,000 to add a sub-consultant. Number three, at Rising Star, a $500,000 change order for work that has already been done, performed. Number four, big contractors seem to know that the current board is handing out free money. Number five, but it gets worse. Board review is currently required for amounts above $250,000. But the board is proposing to up the amount to $500,000 and further reduce board oversight. Please vote no. On the Hearst Jones yearbook contract, I encouraged a local small minority and women-owned business to apply, and they were ignored. Please vote no. On Jane Adams Field Lighting, a retired city surface water expert testified that the project would endanger water quality in Thornton Creek. Please vote no. On the GCCM contract for Rainier Beach, the project would demolish the school. Please vote no. Also, I understand that voters have filed charges to recall the school board from office. Thank you. Ms. Wilson-Jones. Next on the testimony list is Todd Sawicki. Todd Sawicki. Todd Sawicki, if you're on the line, you may need to press star six to unmute. Moving to the next speaker, Manuela Sly. Manuela Sly. Hello, can you hear me? Oh, sorry. Did I hear Hello, Todd? Hello, can you this hear me? Todd Swicky. Sorry, I'm back. I okay. was having difficulty unmuting. Thank you. So let's go to Todd and then Manuela. Um, thank you for your patience. We'll come to you next. Uh, my name is Todd Swicky. I'm a resident of Director Rivera Smith District and a parent of a Robert Eagle Staff Middle School student. I'm responding to recent comments from Director Rankin talking about in-person study hall model for reopening grades 6 through 12. Is that a joke? Is this board actively trying to work with the administration to create an in-person learning environment that is so flawed that students and families just quit the district? It's fine to propose different ideas, but where is the discussion and consideration in this body to share and determine recommendations from the administration? Where is the active questioning from this board in a public and televised forum so all families can witness the model with their pros and cons? How has the remote learning task force not meeting regularly to discuss this and what will happen on April 19th through the end of the year and of course next year? If this administration is actually working and discussing this topic, where is the evidence of this and why is the board not requiring presentations and discussions? And now, of course, what is the model for grades 6 through 12 in the fall? How is this not a repeated topic? I have read through the February remote learning report, which is buried in a link at the March 6 retreat agenda, and there seems to be no specifics on how students are performing. Instead, the report notes the committee's frustration and concern and lack of responsiveness and support from the administration. Why is the board unable to call this out and demand a response from the administration? Families have to make a choice for next year now given private school enrollment windows. Otherwise, we'll be left scrambling in August again this year, wondering if Seattle Public Schools is the right choice for their family. I can say this, if Seattle Public Schools does not offer a five day a week in-person synchronous school um, learning instruction model for next fall to grade six to 12, then this family will be forced to remove our student from SBS. We want to stay in SBS, but the inability of this board to provide an adequate model for those students who cannot or won't learn well remotely is a reality. And it seems like close to half the families in the SPS uh, agree. The board has failed to ensure the school administration provides adequate educational models for all students. Since in-person schooling has been in state by federal and state public authorities for months, safety is not the issue unless this board, the administration, don't believe in science and data. To date, this board has not required the administration to provide in-person models for those students who cannot or will not be served or will fail to remain for remote education, whether they have disabilities, whether they require parental supervision. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you. Ms. Wilson-Jones? Next is Manuela Sly. Manuela Sly. Good afternoon, can you hear me? Yes. My name is Manuela Sly. I'm president of Seattle Council PTSA and a parent of a student at Seattle, West Seattle High School. First of all, congratulations, Director Erin Dury. It has been my honor and privilege to work with you in Seattle Council, and I look forward to future collaboration. Regarding incoming Superintendent Brain Jones, I'm pleased to see the starting date has been updated to May 1st to ensure a smooth transition. Seattle Council PTSA stands ready to support Dr. Jones. We face forward. Regarding community concerns about the dual immersion pathway in the South End, I cede the rest of my time to former Mercer student, Hazel Ceja. Hello. We can hear you. Go ahead. Okay. Hi, my name is Hazel Ceja and I went to Mercer Middle School. I was given the chance to be part of the Spanish immersion program for over seven years. This program helped me better my understanding of the Spanish language and helped me be able to speak with my family members in Mexico and El Salvador and solidified my identity and heritage. I was able to be in class with very diverse students. I learned about the Spanish culture around Latino students as well as black, white, and Asian people. It helped me learn and inspired and motivated me to perfect my Spanish. This program opened many opportunities for me and would likely do the same to other students. I'm in high school now, and I believe that being bilingual will open up doors for my future. Please continue the Spanish immersion program for South Seattle students. Canceling would be a big mistake. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Wilson-Jones? Next is Robin Reed. Robin Reed. Hello, my name is Robin Reed. I am the parent of a sixth grader. I am asking that the board and the district begin preparations now to offer the option of full-time in-person instruction for all students in September. This is doable. How do we know? Well, for one thing, school districts large and small all over the country are doing it. A new survey reports that half the country's public schools are already open full-time. All public schools in Massachusetts, including Boston, are resuming full-time in-person classes next month. Locally, Lake Washington School District says they'll offer full-time in-person instruction this fall. And we can do it safely. Studies show that when students and teachers wear masks, COVID transmission in schools is very low, considerably lower than in the community at large. For another thing, with universal masking and with the CDC's new evidence-based, science-backed guidelines, we can plan a distance of three feet between students rather than six feet. This is true for elementary age students under all conditions, and for middle and high school students, except when community transmission is very high. For reference, right now in King County, it is not. We have the guidelines. The time to plan is now. Director Hampson, last week you wrote on Twitter, there is no reopening task force. I was speechless. How is it that we've been out of schools for a year and we're not making plans to go back? How is it that stakeholders in every school haven't been having focused conversations all year about classroom setups and lunch and bathrooms and all the things we have to figure out? This should be the district's priority right now. This is where the work is. The CDC states, quote, K through 12 schools should be the last settings to close after all other prevention measures in the community have been employed and the first to reopen when they can do so safely. Resuming in-person instruction is critical for supporting students like my son, who are struggling with remote learning. But it's gonna take planning to get there and SPS needs to engage now in that planning. They need to engage families and teachers and principals now to be ready for the fall. We've seen the scramble that followed Governor Inslee's order. Let's not repeat that in the run up to full-time in-person learning. Thank you. Ms. Wilson-Jones. Next is Sabrina Burr. Sabrina Burr. Sabrina Burr. Sabrina, if you're on the line, you may need to press star six. Moving to the next speaker, Brian Terry. Brian Terry.
Brian Terry. Uh, moving to the next speaker, Noah Zeichner. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, is this Noah? It is. Okay, go ahead, please. Good, after good afternoon. My name is Noah Zeichner. I teach Spanish and social studies at Ingram High School, and I co-lead the International Schools Leadership Team, which is comprised of teachers representing the 10 international schools in the district. Uh, before Ingram, I taught at Chief South International High School for 13 years. At Chief South, I played a leadership role in establishing the Spanish Immersion Program. I served on the International School's Dual Language Immersion Task Force, which completed its work in June 2018. And I was also part of the SEA SPS Dual Language Immersion Committee that was established as part of the last collective bargaining agreement. I'm speaking to you today because I'm very concerned that Mercer's Spanish Immersion Program is in grave danger. Next fall, 40 Spanish dual language students from Beacon Hill and Dearborn Park will arrive to Mercer. They will arrive to discover that the current sixth grade dual language teacher was displaced. They will learn that the sixth grade Spanish immersion social studies class has been cut. They will learn that their new principal might eliminate the Spanish immersion program altogether before they graduate from middle school. Furthermore, uh, there is only one section of Spanish language arts that will be offered next year for these 40 students. Seattle Public Schools made a commitment to Beacon Hill and Dearborn Park dual language students, parents, and teachers that these students will move on to a robust middle school immersion program with literacy and social studies classes. Additionally, there are many Spanish speaking ELL students at Mercer not currently in the program who should and could have access to dual language courses. But this is not just about broken commitments. Research, especially the extensive studies by Thomas and Collier, consistently shows that dual language students begin making big academic gains in both languages after five or six years of a well-implemented DLI program. In other words, the greatest benefits of dual language show up in middle school. Please do not allow a principal to unilaterally cut this middle school program without staff or community input. District leadership must find a way to invest in dual language immersion long-term. Our bilingual students and families deserve it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Wilson Jones. Uh, I think Sabrina Burr is on the line, um, but was having trouble getting unmuted. I don't know if she's on phone or on. Hello, uh, I'm here. There we go. Thank you. Please go ahead, Sabrina. Sorry. Okay. Um, my name is Sabrina Burr. Um, I am a Cleveland High School parent. I've also served with Seattle Council PCSA for over a decade. Um, first of all, I would really like to take this time to thank every last one of our school board members for their service, especially through this very um, trying time, giving of your time and from your family and from the many important things for your life. Um, and I know that everyone has opinion. Um, yesterday, after I saw one of the black males at Seattle Public School failed, I watched the court fail. Then I found out on uh, the recall from Emily Turkins, uh, Jennifer Crow, and Beverly Goodman. And I know that this costs the district money, and I know that this puts more hardship on you. Um, six months into Denise Juno's uh, superintendency, I said she did not have the skills for the act. Many people think that the school board has power that they don't have. And I think that people need to understand what the power is the school board has, what state laws that they must abide by. And so I want to thank Superintendent Juno, but she's made this period far harder than it needs to be. And I welcome, welcome Dr. Jones to the leadership. And I ask everyone to give this man a chance. He was a strategic person for Seattle Public Schools, and he knows the district well. Stop thinking about what you need and think about what our children need, all of them. The governor's uh, call to back to school because of mental health was racist as heck because black students have been feeling that far beyond. Now there's not enough mental health beds for white students. And so we need to pull together because the truth is Seattle Public School is a family for all students, not just the ones with most privileged and those who are parents who are allowed as voices. The one thing I do want to ask for Seattle Public Schools, we're returning to school for some students after we've been off. 
give them the best practices on what they need to do to restore bedtime and all of those things to set our students up for success. Again, to the school board, I thank you from the bottom of my heart for everything you do. Thank you, Ms. Wilson-Jones. Next for testimony is Liz Ann Olson. Liz Ann Olson. Can you hear me? Yes. Hello, can you hear me? We can hear yes, you. Yes, we can hear you. Or okay. Liz. Hello, I'm Liz Olson. I teach dual language US history and literacy in Spanish at Denny. I'm also here to talk as many others about the dual language cuts at Mercer. I have worked in the middle school dual language Spanish immersion program in Seattle since 2006. I began at Hamilton when the program was in its second year and taught there for five years. I then moved to Denny and worked with them as their program was developing as it has focused on following the national research supporting dual language immersion as the top ELL strategy. As has been typical, more than 95% of my students identify as Latinx. 42% of my current students are identified as ELL and the vast majority are currently ELL level four. The demographic is very similar in the Mercer Spanish DL program. Dual language is not a boutique enrichment program, but rather a critical strategy to support our ELL students, maximize the strengths they already have and treat them as the assets they are to our society. From what I understand from Superintendent Juno's statement earlier, it sounds like du Mercer dual language students might only have one literacy period of Spanish instead of the research-based minimum of two periods in Spanish at the secondary level. This is an unacceptable cut to a program that is designed to close the opportunity gap for our ELL and Latinx students. The program at Denny has two periods for our students. The cuts proposed by the current Mercer principal reduce the program to just one period. This is the same way that she dismantled the dual language program at Hamilton. Almost all of the Mercer students impacted by this action are heritage Spanish speakers whose Spanish is reinforced at home and are more likely to become bilingual teachers, doctors, and more. Instead of cutting FCE and offering only one section to the incoming 46th graders, Mercer administration could align with Denny as we have done and recruit from the 72 Spanish speaking ELL students currently at Mercer to fill the program. This current situation also demonstrates why students should have access to DL programs based on their language and not on school boundaries. This decision was made without including students, staff and families. The cuts widen the opportunity gap in the community we have promised to serve. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next is Cassandra Garcia Stokes. Cassandra Garcia Stokes. Can you hear me now? Yes. Hello. All right. Um, I want to start out by shouting out to my former student, Heysiel. Hola, Heysiel. Me gustó escuchar de ti. Gracias por venir y hablar. Um, and then I want to say um, that I am the seventh and eighth grade Spanish dual language teacher at Mercer. And I want to take a, no a moment to acknowledge all the committed educators, students, and families that are supporting the Mercer dual, dual Language Program. I thank you for your support. But I also want to notice the voices that are not here. 80% of my students come from Spanish-speaking families. Their voices were not given a chance to be heard when cuts were made to our program. And I hope that when you hear my voice, you consider the voices that I represent. Seattle Public Schools made a commitment to offer Spanish um, at Mercer. An immersion program must have two periods, as mentioned before, to be an effective program. Also, many of my students are heritage speakers, ELL, ELL exited, and our program honors their language ability, their culture, and it provides opportunity to work on biliteracy skills. In my opinion, this cut should not happen, and I also support a literacy period and a social studies period, especially social studies. I mean, they're both important, but social studies is such an excellent avenue to strengthen the biliteracy skills of our students. I also want to share some successes of our program because I... Um, I feel like there's a lot of talk about what's not working, but things are working. Since I have been at Mercer, 95% of students reached the language proficiency of intermediate low or mid, which is the district benchmark for eighth grade, and some students even exceed it. Our students are currently writing poetry with the Jack Straw Cultural Center in Spanish and have touched on themes of racial injustice, sexism, stereotypes, and dreams for their future. I see kids doing amazing things in my classroom, and I ask the school board and the district leadership to support Mercer's dual language immersion program and prevent the program from being at risk in the future. Thank you. Thank you. 
Next is Tammy Becker Gomez. Tammy Becker Gomez. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Hi, my name is Tammy Becker Gomez, and I am the parent of a sixth and eighth grade Latinx students at Mercer Middle School in the Spanish Dual Immersion Program. I'm here to speak out against the proposed reductions to Spanish Immersion Program at Mercer. Mercer Middle School's continuous improvement plan claims that Mercer will focus on ensuring racial equity access, address the needs of students of color, allocate resources strategically through a racial equity framework, create culturally responsive environments, and work in partnership with families and communities who represent students of color who are furthest from educational justice. But as we all know, actions speak louder than words and inaction speaks even louder. Seattle Public Schools and Mercer must demonstrate through action that they are committed to these goals. Cuts to the dual immersion program are counter to these stated goals. There has been no partnership. The school told parents nothing, no email, no robocall, and certainly not information translated into Spanish the preferred language of the majority of families in the program. No one asked for input or sought to understand the perspective of families and students. They just took a red pen to the budget where it suited them. And in so doing, their actions said they do not value Latinx families, students, or their education. If the goal is allocating resources strategically through a racial equity framework, they would fund and support programs like dual immersion that are proven to close the achievement and opportunity gap for students of color. In short, SPS, must put their money where their mouth is. There are no changes in the works for the Mandarin Immersion Program, yet. This is a priority issue. Priorities are reflected by where resources are allocated. If the goal is to create culturally responsive environments, SPS has to support one of its most culturally responsive programs. Dual immersion allows heritage speakers not only to feel welcome and included at school, but it places value on their cultural identity. Principal Waters referred to the dual immersion program as a boutique program. There is nothing boutique about providing a culturally and linguistically responsive program to students of color. If the goal is to ensure racial equity in our educational system and address the needs of students of color who are furthest from educational justice, appropriate funding will be given to the Spanish Dual Immersion Program. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Wilson-Jones. Next is Erin Gilbert. Erin Gilbert. Erin Gilbert. Hello, can you hear me? We can hear you, thanks. Okay, hi, I'm the parent of a sixth grader in the Spanish dual language program at Mercer who will be directly impacted if the proposed cuts are implemented. I've also taught English and intercultural communication at local community colleges, as well as Spanish and English courses at the University of Washington. So I speak to you as a parent, community member, and educator, um, and I'm here today to highlight the crucial role that the Spanish Dual Language Program plays in the lives of students, particularly Latinx students like my son, here in our communities in South Seattle, and in the long-term educational outcomes for students who are farthest from educational justice. The SPS strategic plan documents a commitment to eliminating opportunity gaps to ensure access and provide excellence in education for every student. Actions that support this goal include creating healthy, supportive, culturally responsive environments, and that is what dual language classrooms do, particularly for the Latinx and Spanish-speaking English language learners in our school community. The most recent assessment data available from SPS, available online on the assessment summary demographic dashboard, reveals the profound opportunity gap faced by Hispanic and Latinx students at Mercer Middle School. When research has shown us time and time again that dual language programs provide exactly the kind of culturally responsive educational environment that affirms multilingual students and families and is essential to the educational achievement of students who are farthest from educational justice, it doesn't make sense to close those programs. In fact, next year, in addition to another sizable cohort of students who will arrive from Beacon Hill and Dearborn Park, there will already be a large community of Spanish-speaking ELL students at Mercer who would benefit from dual language um, Spanish language arts and social science classes. Right now, there is such a pressing need for these classes that if anything, more classes should be added. If that need is not apparent, it is due to the lack of communication between the school and families of students who are already in the program or are eligible to join. In fact, at the beginning of this year, many families were stunned to discover that their students, kids who had been in the Spanish dual language program since kindergarten, were suddenly excluded from dual language classes. Oh, um, Thank, thank, thank you. Thank you. Ms. Wilson-Jones. Next is Gretchen Sloan. 
Gretchen Sloan. Gretchen, if you're on the line, you may need to press star six to unmute. Gretchen Sloan. Are you there, Gretchen? Gretchen, if your um, phone number ends in two five, you may need oh, you may need to press star six again. Are you there, Gretchen? Please make sure you're also unmuted on your phone. Um, oh, we can, can you hear, hear you. Yes, we can hear you. All right, thank you. Oh, man. All right, thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Gretchen Sloan. Thank you to all who have put in the arduous work to build the DLI program from the ground up. I'm speaking both as a Mercer parent of a sixth and eighth grader in the dual immersion program at Mercer and also as a high school Spanish and ELL educator at Garfield High School. Thank you to the board for allowing us the space to have our voices heard regarding, regarding the sizable significance the dual language program brings to our schools and to our communities. Unfortunately, over many years in SPS, I've seen our Latinx students time and time again shy away from taking Spanish classes in high school due to their lack of confidence in reading and writing in their native language because so many had not have been given the opportunity to acquire those skills. However, we had just begun to see the outcomes of the first group of students who had progressed the dual language immersion in Seattle Public Elementary and Middle Schools. What we had previously witnessed was starting to take a turn for the better, more native as well as non-native speakers enrolling in higher level Spanish courses and succeeding. Since heritage speakers make up a considerable, per considerable percentage of the Mercer International School program, school and community, Dual language immersion is a pragmatic way to honor those students' heritage, cultures, and bilingual skills. The program is an excellent way to inclusively close the already disproportionate academic gap and to provide the opportunity to become fully literate in both languages. In addition, this helps to pave the way for all future advantages that bilingual proficiency has to offer, especially in today's increasingly global community and economy. Thank you again for having us today. Thank you. Next is Kelly Roland. Kelly Roland. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can hear you. Okay. My name is Kelly Roland. I teach Spanish at Rainier Beach High School. Rainier Beach was chosen by a previous board to be the DLI pathway for high school in the South End. This decision was made after a community survey where families and involved parties unanimously voted to have the pathway at Cleveland or Franklin. But this is not what I'm here to speak about today. So today I wear my parent hat. I currently have an eighth grader at Mercer in the DLA program and a fifth grader at Hawthorne, Hawthorne Elementary. We are a bilingual family and my children are heritage speakers. Because DLI elementary schools are neighborhood schools in the South End, we were unable to secure a spot for our children at Beacon International or Dearborn. However, upon entering sixth grade at Mercer, my older child was given the stamp test and invited into the program. Uh, this year, exiting the program, my child has said she has increased confidence in her ability to communicate with her family in South America and increased pride in her multicultural identity. We were excited for our younger child to have the same experience. However, current boundary changes will send her to Aki. I have petitioned to Cindy Waters and to enrollment, but have had little success and frankly little confidence in their desire to support the program. I filled out the school choice form. There is no box for us to indicate that our child is a heritage speaker. You can only indicate that your child is a heritage speaker if you wish to go to McDonald or Hamilton. Why are North End Option Schools and South End Neighborhood Schools for the DLI program? This is marginalizing heritage speakers in the South End. I'm frustrated. SPS needs to step up and leadership needs to step on this. Support this program in the South End. Make it equitable for heritage speaking families to participate in this program. Maintaining an address only policy is unequitable and ultimately detrimental to the longevity of this program. We cannot have different sets of rules for the same programs in this district. Make it equitable. Thank you. 
Thank you, Ms. Wilson-Jones. The next speaker is Mary Lanza. Mary Lanza. Mary Lanza. If you are on the line, you need to press star six to unmute your phone. Mary Lanza, please press star six if you're on the line. Okay, moving to the next speaker, Carrie Taylor. Carrie Taylor. Carrie Taylor, please press star six if you are on the line. Moving to the next speaker, Christy Shapcott. Christy Shapcott. Hi, can you hear me? This is Christy Shapcott. Yes, we can hear you. Oh, okay, great. Um, yesterday, I was dismayed to see an email from the Spanish immersion teacher at our middle school. She informed us that Mercer Middle School is phasing out one of the two periods currently offered in Spanish beginning next year. There were no discussions and no community outreach about this. In a year that has felt much like the movie Groundhog Day, so too does having to rise to the occasion of contacting school officials and urging them not to make yet another drastic change to the immersion program in the South End. How can you call it an immersion program when the students would have only one of seven periods devoted to engaging in Spanish? How is this fair to students who have invested so much time and energy in learning Spanish throughout their elementary and now middle school years? Don't South End students deserve the same quality immersion program as students in other parts of the city? I implore you to keep the immersion program as is. Please continue to offer students two classes in Spanish so that they can continue to have a full and well-rounded immersion experience. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Wilson-Jones. I want to take one more pass through in case anyone was having trouble unmuting. Um, Brian, Brian Sorry. Terry, are you, are you on the line? Brian Terry. I'm not seeing the phone number that you gave us. Um, how about Mary Lanza? Mary Lanza. Okay, moving to the final speaker then, Carrie Taylor. Carrie Taylor. It looks like, I think I see Carrie Taylor's phone number. Oh, sorry, it's somebody unmuted who I called previously. Uh, yeah, this is Mary Lanza. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Mary. Go ahead. Oh, great. Thank you. Sorry for the tech problem. Um, so my name is Mary Lanza. I am the World Language Department Head at Mercer International Middle School. I'm a National Board Certified Teacher. I currently teach sixth grade intro to world language at Mercer and eighth grade Spanish 1B. I'm talking on behalf of the elimination of the dual language courses at Mercer because this has a direct impact on the world language department. The, um, the elimination of the sixth grade, there will be an elimination of the sixth grade Spanish and Chinese world language intro classes at Mercer next year. Over the years, we have seen the number of seventh and eighth graders in both Spanish and Chinese courses increase. We attribute this to the early exposure in the world language elective program at Mercer. Without these sixth grade classes, there's a chance that fewer students will enroll in seventh grade classes. World language credit is a high school requirement and we have had great success at Mercer in getting students enrolled in these high school credit courses. The other courses that will be eliminated are the dual language Spanish immersion classes in grade six and seven. This will have a direct impact on the world language teachers at Mercer. There will be a reduction of the Spanish teachers at Mercer from three down to two. The expectation will be that these two Spanish teachers will be teaching all the immersion and all the world language classes. The projected numbers for these Spanish courses will be one Spanish teacher will be teaching 192 students in a day. This is the result of the elimination of the dual language social studies classes, which will permit one teacher to teach both the dual language 
literacy, sixth and seventh grade classes, plus four eighth grade world language Spanish classes. This totals over 192 students in one day. Please consider how Mercer can receive funds to specifically fund the immersion program at Mercer so that we can provide enough courses for both our immersion and world language students. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Wilson-Jones. Um, I wanna try Carrie Taylor one more time. Carrie Taylor, please press star six to unmute your phone. Are you there, Carrie? You may need to unmute on your um, the device you're calling from as well. Oh, please try star six one more time, Carrie. Okay, it looks like you're unmuted if you wanna speak. Um, President Hampson, I think we might be having some tech issues. I can see a phone number that um, for our, our final speaker, but I am not able to hear them. But it looks like they are unmuted on the conference call line. Okay, um, and that's Christine? That's um, Carrie Taylor. Oh, I'm sorry, Carrie. Um, so just one can more time. Can you hear time. me now? We can yes. hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Go Can ahead. Can you hear me now? Yes, please go okay, ahead and perfect. speak. Okay, perfect. Sorry about yes. that. That's okay. Go ahead, please. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yes. Okay, so um, very quickly, um, this is not my first, this is not my first um, time going through a Spanish immersion program. We're also in a Spanish immersion program in California. Um, and my experience with that program, um, as I said to one of the, to keep it short, as I said to one of the principals when we left, is that we were never, never able to talk to the district about making the program better because we spent all of our time fighting to make sure that the program just didn't get worse. Um, when we moved here to Seattle 18 months ago, um, we were able to find a spot at Dearborn because we were in the boundary, which was wonderful. And we've loved the school and we've loved the community. Um, my, my oldest graduated last year in the, what would have been the first Spanish cohort from Dearborn uh, last year. So we're super happy about that. But in the 18 months since we arrived, um, there has been a boundary change at Dearborn, a boundary change at Mercer. And now it looks as though we're dismantling the Spanish program at Mercer. And I'm not going to uh, elaborate why that's a bad idea because many people before me have done so. Um, but I do have a few questions. Once again, we're asking you <laughs> after 18 months not to make it worse or not to make it worse, even if we're not going to make it better. Um, my question was answered actually, whether it was all middles or just us, but if it's us, why are we losing Spanish at a school that has actual native um, Spanish speakers? and many students that, um, that are furthest from educational justice as opposed to any of the other programs that we were cut. My understanding from the community is that they have been kind of constantly having to defend the program since it's been opened. Um, and what I found out this evening that I didn't know before was the boutique comment from our principal. Um, and if this is a principal that has a history of undermining um, dual language programs at um, Hamilton and has this attitude towards dual language. Why was this particular principal put in charge of a school that has not one but two dual language programs? That doesn't seem um, like a supportive move from SBS. Anyways, thank you very much for finally allowing me to speak and I hope you all have a good evening. Thank you for continuing to try. Glad we got you on. Thank you. Okay, we've now reached the consent portion of today's agenda. May I have a motion for the consent agenda? Absolutely, I move approval of the consent agenda. Second. Approval of the consent agenda has been moved by, by Vice President Hersey and seconded by Director Rivera Smith. Do directors have any items they would like to remove from the consent agenda? Seeing none, all those in, I'm sorry. 
Did somebody speak up? No. No. Oh, okay. Hearing none, all those in favor of the consent agenda signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? The consent agenda has passed unanimously. Okay, we've now come to the board committee report section of the agenda. We'll hear briefly now from the chairs of each of the board's four committees. The chairs will also lead off the discussion for each of our action and introduction items later in the agenda. So comments for those items can be made at that time. We'll also return to general board comments at the end of the agenda. Uh, let's start with audit and finance with Director Hersey. Are you ready to provide a committee? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Not too much to report from our last committee meeting. The highlight of the meeting, though, was that we were officially joined by our new public advisor, Mr. Ben Thompson. He comes to us from the county, bringing a wealth of experience uh, in many facets, and I am really excited to have him on board. He joined us for our first meeting uh, this past Monday, March the 15th, and already dove in feet first. Uh, with answering and asking uh, many pertinent questions to the um, dealings of the district. So we were just really thankful and excited to have him uh, in our ranks in this capacity and super excited for what expertise he will continue to bring to the table. Um, the next meeting that we will be having uh, for audit and finance is on April the 5th and following that will be May the 10th. And I will save any other additional comments on specific items for the rest of the reports when we move to the action items. Uh, thank you so much. And for those of you who are interested in joining us for our committee meetings, they start bright and early sharp at 7 a.m. Um, and we hope to see you at the next one if you are so inclined. Thank you. Thank you. And then Operations Committee, Director DeWolf. Thank you, President Hampson. Uh, I wanted to, um, mine will be a quick update because we have a lot of my item, excuse me, the operations committee items on our agenda tonight. In fact, we have 16 items. Um, and just uh, our, our next committee meeting is actually next Thursday. So that'll be April 1st at 8 a.m. And folks can obviously join those meetings or public meetings. Uh, we have a bunch of bars coming through, mostly on BEX 3. Uh, and one I wanted to call out was a, re a replacement of some fleet vehicles. That's probably the only thing that's kind of sticks out. And then we'll also be hearing an update on the student and community workforce agreement. Um, so that will be happening at our April 1st meeting. And as I said, I have 16 items tonight for introduction. So I will just wait to make comments on those. Thank you so much. Okay, and Director Rankin for the um, Student Support Services Curriculum and Instruction Committee. Thank you. Yeah, we had our committee meeting last week, our March committee meeting, and um, it was a, a packed agenda. Um, we had a, an update. Um, it's great to connect with folks from TAF, TAF at Washington, and looking forward to continuing that. That'll be a quarterly update that comes to, um, to our committee. Um, we are, we talked about, uh, dyslexia screeners, that process is going forward. And if you haven't seen, um, emails out there and you're wondering where things are at with dyslexia screeners, um, some, uh, CAI folks are doing a really nice job of, um, explaining some of that to community. They've got a PowerPoint and are, are, are you know, virtually going around the district meeting with different groups, um, to go through. Uh, what that will look like for students um, who, uh, as that rolls out, who will be benefiting from that. So just explaining a little bit about that process. Um, the probably uh, the most the most positive thing <laughs> since the last two weeks is um, I think at our last board meeting I shared that we had uh, been able to select the committee or select the task force um, membership for the outdoor community learning and we had our kickoff meeting last week where um, we were all able to um, see each other virtually and and introduce 
get introduced and acquainted and um, begin this work. And I'm very, very, very just looking forward to that, carrying us through um, the spring and into the fall. We have an amazing group of, of educators and community members, um, parents, community organizations and with a really, really dedicated focus on, on students, centering students, student need and thinking about um, how to support how to support them and possibilities that are coming out of COVID, but also that can carry us through uh, how students engage with education um, into the future. Uh, so I'm looking forward to continuing that work and um, they just have a lot of great wisdom to share with us and I'm really grateful. Okay, thank you, Director Rinkin. And I will report on the executive committee, um, which uh, just occurred on March 17th. The next committee uh, meeting will be on April 8th. Those start at 8 a.m. And the committee is made up of myself and uh, Director Hersey and Director Rivera-Smith. Um, for those that aren't familiar, the executive committee uh, is, is where we set the agendas for our legislative sessions, such as the one today. Uh, we have that initial review is um, at the, the minutes is usually our first uh, item of, of approval. So if, if folks are interested in knowing what's coming up, you want to pay attention to the executive committee meetings. And um, the uh, special attention items that we had this past week included content management system update. Um, we do hear a lot about um, the extent to which uh, our certain systems that we have are not are not working. And um, this is one of those examples where we are aware of, of some of the, the, um, the extent that to which our, our web system, web content management system doesn't um, work well for us as a system. And so on top of everything else that, that staff are lifting up, that work does continue and continues in, um, uh, to a great degree. And so we got a, a great update on that, including um, the prospect, um, assuming that, that we have um, fiscal capacity to have uh, multilingual um, uh, parts of the site. And that was that was some pretty exciting um, presentations by um, Chief Kerry Campbell. Um, and we always look forward to hearing that um, because and I know we're all going to feel really good about that um, ultimate uh, implementation. And then um, we talked about our ne next steps from our board retreat with respect to planning for 2021-22 school year. We do have that report due to, or that plan uh, due to the um, superintendent of public instruction on June 1st uh, and um, have uh, quite a few follow-up meetings on that coming forward and um, talked about our um, superintendent hiring process. Uh, we are about to bring on an interim superintendent and move that date up. And at the same time, we will we'll, we'll be starting to um, do a long-term uh, approach towards our permanent superintendent hiring process, as that also still needs to happen, and um, expect that to be a, a very long and involved community-driven um, uh, process. Um, and then we also um, followed up on our um, status with our director uh, for school board appointment process, which has now been completed. Welcome again, uh, Director Jury. Um, and then our usual updates for government relations, which there has been a lot to update us on with respect to what's happening in the state legislature um, with the um, at the federal level, uh, checking in on our board goals um, around leadership. We have some uh, really important trainings coming up for um, the entire board. And thank you to directors for um, giving um, lots of your time to participate um, in those leadership and best practices um, trainings and work coming up. Um, and I think especially as we go through these, these transition, um, and thank you to staff also who are, are, are um, in many cases, stepping up to uh, participate in those with us. Um, and with that, uh, we will move on. As I said, April 8th is the next meeting at eight o'clock. Um, and we will move on to action items. Uh, the first action item on the agenda is amendment number two to the 2020-21 to 21 City of Seattle FFVP Fresh Fruits and Vegetables Program Agreement. This came through operations on March 11th for approval. May I have a motion for this item? Director Mercy. Our Director. Uh, 
Rivera Smith, can you move I, that I, item? Yeah, yeah. I move that the school board authorize the superintendent to accept the January 2020 through August 2021 City of Seattle grant to expand the Fresh Fruit and Vegetable Program grant funding amendment to include an additional $715,402.06 for a total of up to $1,288,927.06. Immediate action is in the best interest of the district. Is there a second? Second. This item has been moved by Director Rivera-Smith and seconded by Director DeWolf. This item is on the agenda for introduction and action today. Chief Operations Officer Podesta, I be, believe you will be giving the staff briefing. Yes, thank you, President Hampson. Um, Seattle Public Schools partners with the City of Seattle on the Fresh Fruits and Vegetables Program Grant um, to provide uh, fresh vegetables and fruit um, in snacks to as part of uh, student meals in um, 20 targeted schools during our regular operations. During the past year, um, where this school year, where we've been mostly in a remote learning model, as directors are aware, we've um, introduced many new products and ways of um, distributing meals and and um, food to families and students um, through uh, a variety of mechanisms, which has really increased the amount of fresh fruits and vegetables we've been able to make available to our students. So we really appreciate the support from the city to increase the size of the grant um, to continue to provide this level of service through the rest of the school year and as part of the summer program um, as that begins to take shape. And um, the city has been a great partner and this will increase the distribution again because of the nature of the way we're distributing meals. This is really available district wide and there are new products. So there is an opportunity to distribute uh, more fresh produce and um, to get financial support from the city to do so. So I'd be happy to take any questions directors might have. Okay, and I'll start with uh, Chief uh, Chair of the Operations Committee, Director Dwolf. Uh, thank you, President Hampson. We had a good discussion in our uh, committee meeting about this, uh, and we sent this up to the board for approval. So I don't have any questions for you at this time, Chief Podesta, but would um, be happy to also take questions from directors if they have them for either you or myself, but um, looking forward to supporting this. Okay, and let's start um, from the bottom of the order, um, alphabetically by first name, which is with Director Rankin. Uh, no questions for me at this time, thanks. Director Rivera-Smith. Hi, thank you. Um, this seems pretty um, cut and dry. Um, I don't think anybody can disapprove of having fresh fruits and vegetables in our schools. I guess my only question would be, um, Chief Podesta, are there any are there any unintended consequences from this that, that should be noted? Anything at all that we should be aware of? Um, no, not, not really. I mean, there we'll be able to provide produce in different manners in different packaging now that it's not just always kind of a snack. It is, it allows um, students um, to have access to these foods in their home, which is where a lot of learning has been going on this year. I guess I will add, since it is uh, introduction in action, um, the, we've asked for that um, because of course, the sooner we get the funding, the sooner um, the benefits of this can be made available uh, for the remainder of this school year and through the summer. It, it, it's a fairly significant in, increase to the overall side. Thank you for that. No further questions. Hey, just checking in. Can you all hear me now? Yes, now we can hear you. Oh, great. Sorry, I don't know. It's my microphone, but I am here. Okay, thank you. Um, and now we will go to um, Director Harris. Uh, it's my pleasure to support this, and it's my also, why uh, school nutrition teams and Fred Podesta's team making this happen when 
folks are economically uh, disadvantaged, and they certainly have been in this pandemic year. And I think that our meal services and meal service deliveries are the stunningly most important great thing that we have done in this last year and to make sure that fruits and vegetables are both expanded and encouraged is is awesome and I thank the city for those funds. Thank you. Thank you and um, now we go actually to um, Director Dury. I have no questions at this time, thank you. Okay, Director uh, Hersey. None for me at this time. Thank you. Excited about this. Okay, I don't have any questions. Um, so with that, I think we can call for the vote. Ms. Wilson Jones. Director Rankin. Aye. Director Rivera Smith. Aye. Director Dury. Aye. Director DeWolf. Director DeWolf. Aye. Director Harris. Aye. Director Hersey. Aye. Director Hampson. Aye. This motion has passed unanimously. We will now move to action item number two, a renewal of master state elevator maintenance and repair contract. This came through operations on March 11th and is recommended for approval. Uh, Director DeWolf. Do you need a motion? Oh, I'm sorry, thank you. Yes, we have a motion for this <laughs> item. <laughs> it's all good. I move that the school board authorize the superintendent to execute the elevator conveyance maintenance and repair contract with Altec in the amount of $290,000 with any minor additions, deletions, and modifications deemed necessary by the superintendent to implement the contract. Immediate action is in the best interest of the district. Second. This item has been moved by Vice President Hersey and seconded by Director Rivera-Smith. This item is on the agenda for introduction and action today. Chief Podesta, I believe you'll be briefing us. Uh, yeah, yes, thank you. Um, we need to have an elevator maintenance contract, obviously, for practical purposes. We have many elevators throughout the uh, more than 100 buildings operated by Seattle Public Schools. This is also a fairly prescribed process um, in, state regula in state regulations. We're required by the Department of um, Labor and Industries to have a certain structure of contract and then also required to select from a roster um, developed by the Washington State Department of Enterprise Services. Um, these contracts are, um, the roster is uh, split up geographically across the state. Um, uh, we've chosen for our area vendor that we've had, that ha holds our cert current contract, so is familiar um, with our particular equipment in our buildings, and then also offered the most advantageous pricing so this is really a renewal of an existing contract that will um, cover us for the next period. Happy to take any questions. Director DeWolf. Thank you, President Hampson. This, uh, as Chief Podesto was mentioning, this one's pretty straightforward. This is a uh, contract for um, basically uh, our routine maintenance of elevators, lifts, and conveyances in the district. So this is mostly just straightforward requirement and um, happy to support this and, and thanks for the work on bringing this forward, Chief Podesta. So turn it back over to you, President Hampson. Thank you. Uh, questions from you, Director Hersey. No questions from me at this time. Thank you. Director Dury. No questions, thank you. Director Harris. A couple of questions for Chief Podesta, if I might. Why is this um, intro and action at the same time? And did we send out another RFP? And uh, my comment is that our first duty is not to educate our children them safe, and I appreciate elevator maintenance. Thank you. Um, 
Uh, I'll be honest. Uh, thank you for the questions, Director Harris. I'll be honest that we are just bumping up against a deadline as we are reopening buildings. Um, our facility operations folks who manage these relationships are just pulled every which way from Sunday and um, we're just a little slow getting this into the process, um, which is why we're trying to get this approved um, before any current contracting expires. The competitive process for this is actually managed by the state, um, uh, the Washington Department of Enterprise Services, and that um, gives us a roster to choose from. We made an internal selection again um, based on um, pricing and qualifications, mostly being that uh, they're in our geographic area of the ROSP, offer the best pricing and is, um, has a good track record providing service to the district and is familiar with our particular equipment. I guess then that I would follow up with a request to senior staff that if it's intro in action, you can tell us why it is intro in action so we don't have to push back and question. Thank you. Certainly, thank you. Director, uh, I can't remember, Director Rankin? No, sorry, Director Rivera-Smith? That's okay. Um, I actually don't have any questions or comments right now. Thank you. For Thank you. I got caught up on the SZ and the names. Uh, Director Rankin. <laughs> um, I know Lisa, Liza, Rankin, Rivera. <laughs> easy to easy to mix up. Um, I I don't have any questions. I being trapped in an elevator is one of my irrational fears, along with being lost in space. Um, uh, and being trapped in an elevators more likely to happen. So maintenance is a good thing. Uh, great. Yeah, well, we can uh, add to the things we now know about Director Rankin, <laughs> and, uh, and and I will add to that my belief that the uh, elevator and escalator uh, companies um, have uh, a, um, that there's a conspiracy to keep all of those um, not working particularly well so that their maintenance uh, contracts are, um, are, are well supported. Um, but that said, I have no um, particularly articulate or specific questions on this needed um, action at this time. So thank you. Um, Ms. Wilson-Jones? Director Rivera-Smith? Aye. Director Dury? Aye. Director DeWolf? Aye. Director Harris? Aye. Director Hersey? Aye. Director Rankin? Aye. Director Hampson? Aye. This motion is passed unanimously. We will now move to action item number three, establishing May 1st, 2021 as the start date for interim superintendent, Dr. Brent Jones, and authorizing the execution of a mutual early separation agreement with superintendent Denise Juneau. May I have a motion for this item? Absolutely. <clears throat> I move that the school board A establish May 1st, 2021 as the start date for Dr. Brent Jones as interim superintendent for the district on the terms and conditions contained in the interim superintendent's um, employee agreement dated March 1st, 2021. B authorize Dr. Jones to employ superintendent Juno as an hourly employee between May 1st, 2021 and June 30th, 2021 at per diem rate set in her April 25th, 2018 employment in agreement, and C, authorize the board president and chief legal counsel to execute the mutual early separation agreement as attached to this board action report with Superintendent Juneau. Immediate action is in the best interest of the district. Second. The item has been moved by, by Vice President Hersey and seconded by Director Vera Smith. This item is on the agenda for introduction and action today. This item did not go to committee and I will be introducing the item. Uh, and I will also ask uh, Chief Narver to provide some additional context after I've finished my comments. Um, I, I, more than comments, I want to express my gratitude to Superintendent Juneau and uh, to incoming uh, interim superintendent, uh, Dr. Brent Jones 
for their flexibility and openness um, and collegiality um, in um, working through this process uh, to ensure a smooth transition. Uh, the timing of this transition, um, it, they're, they're, it's a really difficult time to be going through this transition. And I really couldn't be more more grateful um, for their their willingness to come to a mutual agreement um, about what worked um, for all parties involved and um, is in the best interest of the of the school district. So my gratitude um, to them and um, that this is happening um, with with really very little cost to the district. And we certainly have uh, Superintendent Juno to thank for that. Um, so uh, I want to then. Um, pass it off to Chief Narver um, if you have anything to add to that before I go to questions. Uh, I'd be happy to. G good afternoon, Greg Narver, Chief Legal Counsel. Uh, welcome to Director Dury. I look forward to working with a fellow Salmon Bay parent. Uh, also on the line is Deputy Chief Legal Counsel John Sirqui, who worked on this matter as well. Um, on February 24th, the board approved the hiring of Dr. Brent Jones as interim superintendent and approved the terms of his employment agreement. Uh, at that time, the anticipated start date for Dr. Jones was July 1st, but as it happens, he is available to start work on May 1st and Superintendent Juno has agreed to this early transition. The terms of that are set forth in the bar and in the attached agreement. Uh, this is up for intro and action, and I'll answer the question why. Uh, Dr. Jones just, he needs to know if he's starting on May 1st and so that he can uh, plan for that transition and be ready to take the reins of the uh, superintendent's job on that date. Um, that's uh, That about sums it up, but uh, um, Mr. Sirkwe and I would be happy to answer any questions if there are any about the, the terms of the agreement or the, uh, the change to Dr. Jones's start date. Okay, we'll start um, with uh, Director Rankin for questions, comments. Um, uh, my question is is not about the start date, but about the hourly. Is that just like um, on an as needed basis, kind of for consultation as the beyond the transition period? Correct. That's uh, that's um, exactly for that consultation on. Uh, Helping on the helping on the transition. And does the board need to? I mean, approval of this would allow that to happen at at the behest of Dr. Jones and Superintendent Juno, as exactly that becomes necessary. It's a pre-authorization for this limited period of time for Dr. Jones to engage uh, Dr. Uh, Superintendent Juno as a as a consultant on an as-needed basis. Correct. Okay. Um, I don't have any other questions. Thanks. Director uh, Rivera-Smith. Thank you. Um, no questions per se. I, I do want to join in thanking Superintendent Janel for her three years um, of service on our in our district and all the um, energy and passion she put into there. Um, and I, I also welcome Dr. Jones. Thank you. And Director Harris. Uh, thank you. No questions, but comments, if I could, please. Um, I, I think it's important to mention that we retained third-party counsel, former state Supreme Court Justice Phil Talmadge, to assist us in that, to avoid any appearance of any conflicts of interest. I think it's important to mention that the article that came out in the Seattle Times suggested that uh, Superintendent Juneau is going to get $300,000, which um, if she wanted to push back, she might have gotten that if we had entered into a very ad adversarial relationship, and we did not. That is not what this bar says. And... Um, I appreciate Superintendent Juneau's um, elegance, frankly, in not pushing litigation or any other issues. And my hope is, is that the 15 days that's included in this bar for 
uh, collaboration between Superintendent Juneau and Dr. Brent Jones is, um, is rich and powerful and an elegant handoff. And uh, as I have said before, I promise Dr. Brent Jones my very best efforts. Thank you. Thank you, um, Ms. Dury. I'm sorry, Director Dury. Um, I have no questions at this at this time. I, just this quick comment. I also want to thank um, Superintendent Juno and Dr. Jones for engaging in this process and allowing uh, a longer runway to get Dr. Jones in place for a successful summer and school upcoming school year. Director Hersey. Uh, no comments from, or excuse me, no questions from me. Just again, thanking Superintendent Juno for her work and service to the district up until this point. I think this move is going to be critical for us to give as much runway and as much opportunity uh, for Dr. Jones to orient himself to the role uh, in order to make sure that we are not only setting ourselves up for success during our last few weeks of school um, this year, but also more importantly, Importantly, uh, planning for you know the services that we plan on offering during the summer, as well as a strong start in the fall of next year. So I'm just super excited that this is moving forward. I'm incredibly thankful for all of the parties involved. Um, this is no easy feat. A transition takes a ton of time, and the fact that uh, things have been going so well so far between uh, Superintendent Juno and Dr. Jones is a clear sign that um, we are headed in the right direction. So again. And thanks all around. Excited to move this forward. Uh, Director DeWolf. Thank you, President Hampson. Uh, just want to uh, reiterate gratitude to Superintendent Juno, um, and I really appreciate the thoughtfulness around um, uh, making sure this transition is really thoughtful. I guess I'm overusing that word, but I really do appreciate that um, we rolled this back to May 1st. I think it'll really set Dr. Brent Jones up really well for the upcoming school year. So uh, grateful to see this. Thank you for your work on this, President Hampson and Chief Counsel Narver. I know um, a, a lot of work we don't see uh, on, on the dais, and so we appreciate all the work that you put in behind the scenes. Thank you for that. And John Sirkley as well, and, and Phil Talmadge, and um, uh, the folks that supported Superintendent Juneau on her side, and uh, definitely a gratitude to her attorney as well. So. Um, with that, um, Ms. Wilson-Jones, will you call for the vote? Director Dury? Aye. Director DeWolf? Aye. Director Harris? Aye. Director Hersey? Aye. Director Rankin? Aye. Director Rivera-Smith? Aye. Director Hampson? Aye. This motion is passed unanimously. We will now move to action item number four, approval of addendum to the August 2020 Memorandum of Understanding between, otherwise known as an MOU, between the Seattle School District number one and Seattle Education Association. May I have a motion for this item? Absolutely. I move that the school board approve the addendum to the August 2020 MOU as attached to this board action report, which will become effective upon ratification by SEA on March 26, 2021. I further move that the school board waive the provision of policy number 1420 that board action reports and relevant supplementary information will be posted to the district's website at least three days in advance of board meetings. This action authorizes the superintendent to take all necessary steps to implement the district's responsibilities detailed in the addendum. Immediate action is in the best interest of the district. Second. This item has been moved by Vice President Hersey and seconded by Director Vera Smith. This item is on the agenda for introduction and action today. This item did not go to committee. Chief Human Resources Officer, Dr. Clover Codd, I believe you will be giving the staff briefing. Yes, thank you, good evening. Uh, so what you have before you is an addendum to the memorandum of understanding that was agreed to with the Seattle Education Association 
and approved by you in August of 2020. This addendum outlines a phased in approach to restoring in-person services for preschool through fifth grade students and for pre-K through 12th grade students receiving services through special education intensive service pathways. The addendum contains provisions in the following main areas, informed decision-making and supported communication, health and safety, instructional model for the PK through five and PK through 12 special education intensive service pathways, leaves and accommodations, workload and educator expectations and evaluation. The fiscal impact to this board action report is approximately $5.8 million. We did do two different racial equity analysis uh, throughout bargaining with SEA this um, past winter one on our proposals and one on the budget. Um, staff have already actually started working under the terms of this agreement this past Monday, March 22nd, with the three days of training um, that are needed in order to prepare staff to support students who will be returning on March 29th. Um, and with that, I think I will open it up for questions. Thank you. Uh, let it, let's go um, starting with uh, Director Hersey from the top of the order. Thank you very much. Um, the only question I have is that just for the public's sake, could um, we give a little bit of what could potentially happen if um, SEA does not ratify the agreement? I've gotten that question uh, several times over the past couple of weeks. And just from the district's perspective, it would be good to provide some road mapping in the event that that were to occur, just so that uh, our constituents have as much information as possible. Sure. Um, so if SEA uh, were not able to get the votes in order to ratify this agreement, um, which we understand we will have that information by Friday evening, the bargaining teams would go back to the negotiations table. We would continue to bargain in good faith, of course, um, so that we can get to a new tentative agreement that would then be bought, brought back to the membership for a vote. If that were to happen, we would not be able to start school on Monday, the 29th, for the students outlined in this board action report. And that would be pushed off to um, April 5th, which would then be under the governor's executive order. So we are hopeful uh, that this will pass. The vote, I believe, started yesterday and runs through Friday. And we uh, will let you and the public know as soon as we have any more information about that. Thank you so much. OK, Director Harris, I'm sorry, um, Director Drury. Um, hi, uh, given how new I am and how much um, depth and process this this decision has, I do have lots of questions, um, but I feel that this might not be the time to take them up and um, we'll be abstaining from this vote. Thank you, uh, Director Dury. Did you have any questions you wanted to ask? Uh, not at this time. Okay, thanks. Uh, uh, Director Harris. Uh, first, let me start by thanking all of our teachers who are beyond heroes in my book and thanking both sets of bargaining committees, both from SPS and from SEA, I do have a concern about the fact that we're taking apparently four nurses away from school duties to uh, work on administrative issues. But I also understand that uh, there was in fact an SEA nurse representative at the bargaining table. And social media being what it is, I don't know the veracity of what is being printed out there but I would suggest that um, we don't have enough nurses. Our prototypical model is not funded, and that comes to the fore right now, right here. And um, I hope we all communicate better in the future, and certainly hope we all communicate better in the future for MOUs, for uh, 6th or 12th MOUs 
that are being bargained as we speak. But huge gratitude to the folks that gave up their weekends, that gave up their nights, that have been working around the clock to make this happen. And there is no way that everyone will be satisfied, but it's my hope that we can move past this and do an even better job on uh, 6 through 12. And we can get started the day that that one is signed, hopefully, on next fall's contract. Thank you. Thank you, Director Harris. And I believe uh, Chief Berge would like to speak to the four additional nurses that we actually have provided. Um, there's some misinformation on social media. Mm -hmm. Chief Berge. Hi, good evening, everyone. So I'll just give you a little bit of background. Um, you know, a lot of the staffing has been confusing this year because we did come into the year over staff. So let me just say this. We hired a new manager position, which was a new position specifically for COVID. That was Carrie Nicholson's position. Many of you are familiar with her work. So we did add um, a position there um, for overall COVID work and nurse, in particular health and science nursing. We were overstaffed by two FTE this year. Those positions weren't eliminated. We're carrying those this year and we committed to carrying them next year as well, um, even with the lower enrollment projection. And then uh, Dr. Petroza's team had done some additional substitute nursing commitments. So additional staffing of about three FTE were garnered through those some dollars that she had available to hire some additional substitute nurses. Nurses aren't easy to find, right? They're not easy for us to find, um, but we did provide some additional supports. Anything else, um, Director? Harris in response to that? No, thank you. Okay. Uh, Director um, Rivera-Smith. Hi, thank you. Um, I, I, this has been a long, I know, okay, first I'll just say thank you. I know that's been, it's been a long process here, um, both for our SPS um, negotiators and the SCA negotiators. Um, and it's had to be um, expedited to an extent because of the different governor's orders. So thank you for all the work done there. Um, I know that no plan is perfect. So there's gonna be a lot of um, questioning and criticism of this um, MOU. So um, we're gonna have to stand strong in that. Uh, I know that the educators are still voting on it. And so we will all wait their decision too on this. Um, but I, and I will just, I think I'll just um, ask it's more of an expectation and question, but um, in the summary, uh, Chief Codd has here that um, under steps to address disproportionate school closure impacts, that when the district COVID central team concludes a school has or will be more heavily impacted by school closures, additional and appropriate plan of support will be provided and applied. Um, I'm wondering, um, I, like, again, I hope that that would happen before the school actually opens so that those things can be in place. And I guess just my question is, is that the, is that the plan? That's my understanding, Director Rivera-Smith. I mean, a lot of this um, outlines that what we will have to do, and those are our intentions. And so exactly how we will be responding when we do the racial equity analysis has not been determined, just that we will. Thank you. Is there a, a, a specific tool being developed for these for these schools, or are we using the one that that we have that already? We we actually have a racial equity analysis to, tool during COVID that um, the SPS team had been working on. Somebody else on this call, either Chief Scarlett or Chief um, Pedroza, might be able to speak more to that tool. But that is the tool that we'll be using and have used throughout this this bargaining process. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, yeah, I don't have any other questions or comments right now. Thank you so much. Director Rankin. Thank you. Um, I, I don't have questions, but I have comments. Um, the, just to reiterate for folks listening, the timing seems, seems funny that we're approving this before it's been been ratified and just to I guess re-emphasize that it's it's if ratified 
it's approved um, and that it, the voting is still open until Friday. And that just has to do with the way that the timing worked out with the order and how quickly things can move through the full board and the full membership and all of that. Um, something that I want to, uh, or some, something that I have noticed in relationship to this item that I want us to think about in relationship to the future is that um, uh, there's a lot of misunderstanding about what a bargaining agreement means and how how this works and where the different decision making points are. And so, so I will just to say that I, I really hope that between this process and the process for fall, um, we'll have a, more opportunity to discuss as a full as a full district community um, where our different uh, levers of influence are and how um, you know that this is this is protection for for teachers. This is work job job protection, work site protection, and benefits. But because of the timing of all these various decisions, there's a lot of instructional model kind of tied up in that. And um, as one of our public comment uh, speakers noted, you know, deciding the instructional model and thinking about you know what we want school looks like school to look like in the fall really does need to be that full community discussion. And we don't have, you know, the luxury of a huge amount of time, but there will be time between um, between the kind of closing out on these agreements for um, the remainder of this school year and going into discussions about fall that I'm just really looking forward to us kind of all coming back to that as educators, as families, as students, as staff um, and board and, um, getting out of the sort of uh, adversarial viewpoint and coming back together around the needs of students um, as, a, as a community that is separate from the very necessary um, agreement between the, the district and the union in, in, uh, to provide labor protections. So, um, uh, yeah, <laughs> I guess that, that is all for me. Director Rankin, I might just um, add, if I may, Director President Hampson. So one of the reasons why this, the timing of this is just um, less than ideal, I guess I'll say, is that staff who are going to be educating the students who show up on Monday the 29th, they actually started working under these agreements on this Monday, March 22nd, so two days ago. So they kind of in good faith been working under what's already been outlined in the tentative agreement. So timing is definitely not ideal. We do understand that if it does not pass um, this Friday, we will need to go back to the bargaining table and um, figure out what we need to do to get to a yes. Um, and the other thing I'll just say uh, to, you know, to you all in the public is that for a hundred years, we've had one instructional model in public education. And then all of a sudden we were forced because of a worldwide pandemic to change that model. And our educators did heroic work to try to figure out, and I mean our principals, our support staff, our nutrition services staff, our teachers, our everybody, really um, under very unusual and extreme circumstances, had to figure out a different kind of a model, a different way of educating and this um, MOU and the addendum to the MOU is still part of that. We bargained in a pandemic. We're still trying to figure out what does a hybrid model of instruction look like in a pandemic. There was no roadmap for this. Nobody had it figured out. I do believe that whatever we come up with in the fall will be much better, but I'm very proud of the work that our educators and our school leaders and our central office team have done over the past year to, to bring us to this point. And I also want to thank the bargaining teams because they put in hundreds of hours to try to get to this point. Absolutely, thank you. I meant to add my gratitude to both uh, bargaining teams or multiple bargaining teams for all the time and effort in super high pressure situations. So um, thanks to everybody for putting in that work. Okay, so um, just a, a couple comments um, from me. I, I, I do want to state, um, I don't see, we, we have a, a shockingly small audience it actually, actually <laughs> it appears, so maybe folks are will be watching later, um, that this is the culmination of a lot of work and it is the culmination of work 
uh, that was headed in one direction and then had to had to. Uh, I do see your hand, Director DeWolf, because I may have skipped you. Is that what you're saying? I skipped you. you I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I keep messing up on your order because of the whole ops thing. Um, so I will come back to you um, after I make my comments uh, that um, this the board is is um, uh, has closed session discussions about bargaining with with staff um, as we go through the process. And, and um, so we we have this is one of the few areas where we do have discussions because of the nature of bargaining that is in closed session um, with staff on an ongoing basis. And staff has done a great job keeping us surprised um, throughout this. And the uh, closeness to which we were with our originally proposed um, uh, in-person return, which did not, had all students um, through fifth grade returning, did not have all um, six through 12 students returning for this year. Um, that shift was a massive one. And so it's amazing that we were able to get to an agreement and um, and I know that that this the members of this board were very grateful when we were able to get, to get to that moment. So there's not a lot that is new under the sun with what we're seeing here today. The timing, as folks have said, is difficult. Um, there are many things in this agreement that any one of us as a staff, board, educator, parent, student um, can take issue with and um, and yet it is, the, it, it is the ability to get to this agreement that allows us to move forward, um, which is obviously critical at this time um, for K through five. So um, there's no, uh, there's nothing for us to sort of, um, you know, dive in deeply to because that's all been determined and we need to honor the place that, that the bargaining teams got to honor their contributions, honor their work. Um, it was incredibly difficult for them to get to this place. We are known as a district that has processes on top of processes and processes to discuss those processes. And um, and so we do that, that creates um, a longer process. And I would like that we could move to a place where, where we don't have that and that that, that lengthy um, sets of processes and that will take breaking down of silos and creating better communication and I, I believe that we're all um, committed to to moving in that direction um, but we are who we are in this moment in time and so coming to this place is is really um, a huge accomplishment and um, with that I will be um, supporting this wholeheartedly and I hope folks in the um, community um, are able to, to make peace with it and um, and 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 flex in the ways that we all need to to make sure that this happens for our kids and I, I we're all super excited about kids coming back on on monday the 29th and now i will turn to director dewolf to let him add a final comment oh one last thing um uh chief cod could you please state that the 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 fiscal um uh cost and and this is something that i want to see in a press release um when we approve this that um how much is this costing us 5.8 million, so 5,875,465 as an approximation put out by our budget, um, Chief Berge. And that goes toward, if you could just give me a short list of the top items. So um, I believe it's seven days of COVID uh, leaves. We've got uh, extra time for professional development for substitutes. Um, Chief Berge, you did the analysis. You might have the Excel spreadsheet in front of you. Um, I do. I know seven days is a big part of it. <laughs> yeah, so we had substitutes, um, training for substitutes. Uh, we had the building safety team stipend. We have the, the well, we have MERV th filters, but we didn't include that. We did have to order another um, bunch of HEPA air filters for this. Um, there's more translations and comm support. And then there's also the um, benefits that we put in. So Chief Codd talked about the seven days of emergency circumstance paid leave. Um, and then we also have quarantine leave. And so we did estimates on a certain percentage of SCA needing to access those um, benefits. Thank you. And, and I just want to note that these um, agreements were made and these costs are and the, 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 um, that dollar amount arrived at 
in spite of having absolutely no assurance that uh, that we would have support from the state uh, or that the the governor would ultimately um, be uh, allowing monies from the feds to come through. We, we have seen the state already supplant um, both uh, enrollment um, uh, stabilization dollars and transportation dollars. And so uh, that they managed to get to this point in spite of not knowing that we were going to have support from the state to actually pay for the things for which we were bargaining is a is a huge task. Um, and it's uh, not a dynamic that I would hope um, I would ever see this state repeat again, where they withhold funds um, uh, as a, a, a stick approach to um, to getting us to an agreement, which makes it, I believe, much more difficult for you all to bargain when you don't even know if you can pay for the things that you're trying to provide to our educators. Okay, Director DeWolf, thank you for that summary. Director DeWolf. Thank you, President Hanson. Appreciate having a moment here. Uh, I wanted to just quickly ask Dr. Codd if you could just share, I know one of the big sticking points was around kind of our, our school facilities. And I know if you could just briefly remind folks the process that you went through to bring in a uh, kind of a cohort of folks to do um, walkthroughs, just to clarify kind of one of the, one of the issues that I think was out uh, in, in the news for a bit about one of the sticking points, but um, the, the process that you went through. Sure, and actually um, Chief Podesta and Chief Berge would probably have more um, details around that, but we did ask Labor and Industries uh, to come in and walk through our buildings uh, jointly with leaders from Seattle Education Association and leaders from the central office in Seattle Public Schools to look at this, the health and safety protocols and guidelines that we have in place, look at some of our HVAC um, to make sure that people felt uh, more confident when we said we had things in place and we're meeting the, the health and safety guidelines, we wanted to be able to bring more confidence to our labor partners um, and our public in being able to say that by having an external organization come in and sort of verify, if you will, that what we were saying is is actually what we were doing. Thank you. Um, I, I appreciate that. I think that was one of the biggest sticking points. Um, and so appreciate the work to, to bring it, pull that together um, to bring some assurance uh, and some comfort to our educators. Uh, I know it's a, a scary thing to um, think about coming back after a long year uh, of, of COVID. We were in our homes, we were locked down, we were in quarantine. So, you know, a lot of these activities that we want to think are normal, you know, we have to adjust our thinking around that. And so I really just want to give you gratitude, big ups to you at SPS and SEA on, on the bargaining teams on this. And, and just as a small note, I think to our community, you know, we've been getting notes about one of the conversations we're going to have about start times and transportation and this MOU and the current instructional model. And we are still in the thick of this pandemic. Uh, cases are up 30% here in Seattle, 18% in King County. Variants are still out there. Not everybody's getting vaccinated. And I don't know how many people really want to get vaccinated. I myself do uh, and support it. Um, so, I think the idea to go back to normal, I just want to help people understand, I hope people understand that normal is not something we're necessarily working towards. Right now, I think we're just working towards finding some some ways to to, to bring back uh, experiences that we had, where whether it's in person or online. But at the end of the day, this looks and feels different. And we have to be comfortable. We have to be resilient. We have to be flexible and agile to difference. Things are going to feel weird. And I'm not, I'm not saying I'm just going to call on all of us adults to stop projecting our stress and our anxiety onto our young people. And for young people, I just want to say this. You are already enough. You are already valued. You are already loved. You are more than a grade. You are more than a test score. You are more than grades or GPAs. Or you are not behind. You have not fallen down. You don't have learning loss. You aren't less than. You're perfect as you are. This is not a horse race. So I appreciate the work that's gone into this. I'm excited to re, you know, take this opportunity to do something different with our education system by this hybrid model and bringing back students in person. I, I hope and I trust that we'll be able to do it safely and appreciate all the work that's gone into this. This is not an easy conversation. This is not easy bargaining. This is not an easy issue. And I just really ask our community to hold close to yourself that this is a conversation and a topic that we're all going through together at the same time as you. 
And so just to come together and, and understand this stuff is with grace and we hear you and we feel you and we understand where you're coming from. And I'll just end with that, but thank you to all the work that's gone into this. Thank you, Director DeWolf. We really appreciate that. Thank you. Okay. Um, some inspiring words. Um, Ms. Wilson Jones, will you call for the vote? Director DeWolf. Aye. Director Harris. Aye. Director Hersey. Aye. Director Rankin. Aye. Director Rivera Smith. Aye. Director Dury. Abstain. Director Hampson. Aye. This motion has passed by a vote of six yes to one abstention. Okay, the excitement continues. We will now move to action item number five, approval of a revised of revised bell times for elementary and K-8 schools for the remainder of the 2020 to 21 school year. May I have a motion for this item? Absolutely. I move that the school board approve the revised bell times for elementary and K-8 schools listed in the background section of this board action report. These changes will take effect on March 29, 2021, and will remain in effect for the remainder of the 2020-21 school year. Immediate action is in the best interest of the district. Second. This item has been moved by Vice President Hersey and seconded by Director Vera Smith. This item is on the agenda for introduction and action today. This item did not go to committee. Chief Podesta, I believe you will be briefing us. Yes, uh, thank you, President Hampson. So school bell times, and for uh, anyone listening or not familiar exactly with that term, really just means the start and end of the school day at a particular school building are adopted, established annually by the board when the board adopts uh, our transportation service standards, which describes which students are eligible um, for district provided transportation. And in recent years, the district has operated with a two tiered system of bell times, wherein um, many schools uh, have a start of their day at 7.55, have had a start of their day at 7.55, and many others at 8.55 and then a few at 8.45 actually. And this split between these tiers is not perfectly uniform, but it's largely that uh, elementary schools start at the seven, have started at the 7.55 hour and secondary schools at the 8.55 hour. And the point of this and, the, and why it's, they're established with the transportation service standards are this allows us to make efficient use of our transportation resources, in particular, our yellow bus fleet. Um, this allows a set of buses to um, provide uh, transportation to school in the morning um, at, and have students arrive in time for a 7.55 start time. And uh, the same set of buses be turned around to provide uh, transportation to another set of students at other schools at 8.55. As we went into the, um, and this system was originally adopted um, by the board in uh, March of last year for this coming school system, um, somewhat along our normal standards, was then revised once it was, we moved to a rem remote model, uh, still with a two tier system, but with the times closer together, an eight o'clock start time for elementary schools and a nine o'clock start time for secondary schools, um, thinking that this would be easier for schools to manage and for families to manage if they had um, uh, students in in both types of schools that um, the school it, it was closer together and the overall school day would overlap, um, uh, you know, into, you know, more um, succinct uh, time frame. Now that we're uh, trying to welcome more students back into our buildings, we really need to return to our uh, usual practice of having an hour um, between the bell times as we try to transport more students um, to our schools so we can make uh, the same use of that fleet. Because um, if uh, we bring back um, more students um, uh, as per the governor's order, we are going to need to use the complete 
um, fleet of yellow school buses we have, and that only worked on any year because of um, the, the multiple tiered bell time. So we've had discussions also that right now um, we are ramping up transportation and we have um, driver shortages and, and we have some capacity issues. But even if we were full force, we would need to do this um, because this is, the, this is the underlying basis for the system. So this action, um, again, uh, moves the elementary um, bell times, um, starts them earlier, the start of the day and the end of the school day, both are um, half an hour earlier than we had in the remote model. So elementary schools and K through eight schools start at 8 a.m. and end at 2.30 and makes no changes to the secondary um, bell times at this time, that they would still have a nine o'clock start. And that gives us the separation um, that we need that so we can make more efficient use of um, the uh, yellow school buses that are available to us. Um, implementing this in um, by March 29th, as we think through um, uh, welcoming students with um, uh, in intensive uh, special education pathways, um, preschool students, Head Start students, and, and others um, will need this in place now. And this efficiency, we are still in the middle of routing all these students, so it's hard to give exact numbers. We'll, we expect um, this to yield at least 40 buses into the pool um, to allow us uh, just to meet the, the transportation needs that we'll have on March 29th um, and on April 5th for, uh, again, special education pathways, preschool, um, McKinney-Vento, um, students with a 504 accommodation, and our first uh, priority of students that we're transporting and we're legally obligated to transport. And we're hoping as we, if we continue to run the system efficiently, um, as we bring more uh, yellow school buses online, perhaps we can offer more transportation. But even to meet the obligations that you know we've already got in place, we need to have more time to, um, again, bet between start times and end times for bringing students to school and transporting students from school um, back to um, to home. So um, that's, uh, you know, we're really just returning to our normal practice um, and modeling. Again, we, it's around, it's the top of the hour as opposed to 7.55 and 8.55, but Basically, this returns roughly to the model that we've had for in-person instruction for the past several years. Um, a few years ago, the district actually went from a three-tier system to a two-tier system, and this returns us to that, and you know will make um, make us able to meet the transportation obligations that we have right now over the next couple of weeks. So, I'd be happy to entertain any questions directors have. Okay, we'll start with you, Director DeWolf. Thank you, Chief Podesta. Uh, I think my question is just around the student benefit. Can you describe more about the student benefit? Um, again, I think this, you know, uh, it, allows us to provide transportation in this case as with the resources we have um, per our transportation service standards and to those that we're legally obligated um, to. There are frankly only so many yellow school buses available to us and um, if each bus can only make one um, serve one school um, you know one route a day you know we would need to uh, practically double the bus fleet um, to to serve all students. Um, at, uh, uh, last year, when stu while students were still in buildings, we fielded uh, 205 buses per day to serve special services students, and that's about where we are now. We have a few more available to us than that, um, but we again just to meet the transportation needs of of students we need to frankly recycle a bus each day um that it, it can make it can transport two cents of students but we just 
with the equipment and the staffing we have, we can't get students to um, 105 schools all at the same time is what it comes down to. So you need to split those destinations in half. So we and you need some time in between that to um, serve the other set of routes. It's really just managing kind of the peak load of our resources. OK, thank you so much for that. So that's very helpful. My only other question, not a question, more just a comment. Uh, you know, last month we passed our 100% clean energy resolution. So just always always want to put a, uh, a flag or <laughs> promote electric school buses whenever we talk about school buses. So just doing my due diligence, due diligence to remind us of that. So thank you. I, I, I appreciate that. I think e even, you know, depending on capacity and utilization, even a diesel school bus can be um, have a lower uh, carbon footprint than the equivalent number of students each being transported in a single occupancy vehicle. So there, there, there's some efficiency to be gained by, we essentially operate a little transit system and we all know that uh, transit systems can create um, energy efficiencies. But, but we certainly agree, we would like our buses themselves to, to be cleaner than they are. Anything else, Director DeWolf? That's it, thank you. Okay, um, so let's go now with uh, Director uh, Rankin. I feel like no matter what order you go in, I'm always surprised when it's my turn. Um, uh, so yeah, this really, it, we've had some people ask, you know, why couldn't we move the afternoon block later? And I, I hope it's understood that it's not the time between the morning block and the afternoon block, that it's actually the time between the two bell times in the morning. Um, and this is the same issue that we have with transportation, have had before. Um, you may notice that uh, my committee is the only is the one that still meets at 430 in the afternoon and other committees meet at seven o'clock, eight o'clock in the morning that I'm not a morning person. Um, and, uh, you know, people have different kind of sleep sleep patterns. Um, mine and one of my kids happens to not sync with the most of the rest of the world. Um, that being said, you know, even though my my initial response was like, oh no, another change, it, it really is critical that in the context of what we're being directed to provide by the governor, that uh, the accessibility for more students is is the critical thing. And I know there are a lot of people asking questions about working families and the half day schedule and the bell times and all of that. And as uh, Director Hampson said, earlier in relation to the tentative agreement, um, there was a lot of planning that had been done in terms of the broad, you know, safety protocols and procedures, transportation protocols and procedures on the on the on the big scale, but for to actually operationalize different pieces of that plan, um, the board directive was a roll up by groups. And what is very different about um, having to shift to respond to the governor's order to bring everybody back at the same time is that um, first student laid off drivers in October when uh, it was clear that remote was going to be the primary, excuse me, the primary um, uh, educational model for the fall. So we have to, and, and those drivers all couldn't sit around until you know there's another job available for them. So. The amount of time that it takes to train, to f find, hire, and train drivers and to build these routes based upon um, responses from families is, is why there's not clear answers right now for families if you are going to have transportation or not. Um, I just, I hope that that's, that's understood. And also in terms of working families, again, that um, we don't have a lot of great options, but we have to make choices every step of the way along this. Um, and we're trying to make the best that we can. So given that, um, that is leading to the, the change in the bell times. Um, 
I want to add too that we are having a broader discussion about transportation that was scheduled to happen anyway um, to relook at uh, how we can serve more students and um, fit within uh, the budget because as with other things the state does not actually cover the cost of, of transportation fully. Um, but can I so just to ask a question in terms of moving the times later um, can somebody, I guess, just quickly respond to why? Or it's, I mean, it's really that the eight o'clock time is basically a return to what we had, what we had before, as opposed to creating a new timing structure. Is that accurate? I would say there were three factors, and I would invite any of my colleagues to uh, chime in if there are other things that should be considered. That it seemed logical to return to our practice of roughly eight o'clock and nine, you know, nine o'clock to to be kind of where the bell times have traditionally been. Um, moving the secondary bell times would have added another variable into bargaining that's going on right now about the secondary model um, that you know isn't wasn't crystal clear how that was going to end up, and then um, the district is, and I think many families are very appreciative, trying to uh, bring back athletics as much as possible and, um, you know, shifting um, the ending bell times for secondary schools later in the day would create yet another hurdle for that. And so those were three things, but I think yeah. primarily it was, um, we're trying to come back to school the way we operated and that's what this looks like is there's a tier at eight, roughly eight o'clock and there's a tier at roughly at nine o'clock that's that's the way we traditionally operated so returning to that made some sense thank you okay director Vera smith thank you um my, I had a question that was that was just covered and answered because we had heard from a lot of community asking why we did not, um, or if we did consider moving secondary up an hour to make that hour um, time between the two. So thank you for covering that. Um, I will just um, explain to everybody listening that you know this this items coming to us as you can see on the bar, so it didn't go to the committee and. And interaction items are, are kind of difficult because they, they the disadvantage to them is that we don't have time for more conversations or engagement on them. Um, typically, items go into a committee where they're discussed, uh, possibly for more than a month. Then they move into the, to the full board for introduction and then a few weeks later for action. So this is definitely a condensed time frame um, because it is that we are needing to do that. So I'm just explaining to people um, how, unfortunately, because of the interaction nature of this one, we didn't get a chance to speak with more communities um, about any kind of implications that this will have. Um, but I, I know that it was still, you know, there was a lot of thought gone into it. And thank you, uh, Chief Podesta, again, for explaining the, um, the implications that would have been had we moved secondary. Um, it is an adjustment that families are going to be asked to make. And um, that's hard. That's always hard. So we definitely sympathize with that. Um, I likewise am not a morning person, um, Dr. Ingen, so uh, I, I appreciate that you have not moved your meetings to 7 a.m. <laughs> um, and I, but my kids actually are morning people, so hopefully the adjustment won't be too hard for them um, if they do return in person. We haven't even made that decision yet. So um, thank you for the work on this. And um, for, um, I don't have any other questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Director Harris? Uh, several questions and a few comments. Uh, Chief Patricia, you mentioned a hundred, hello? Chief Podesta, you mentioned 105 schools at the same time. That, we're not talking about high schools. They have work passes, correct? Um, they, there are a, a lot of high school students that um, do have ORCA passes. We do provide special education transportation to nearly to many, many schools. So there's some transportation um, typically to practically every school. Okay, I understand that, but, but it feels misleading and inflated to me to say 105 schools at the same time. 
Uh, next question would be, after we have met our legal obligations to students needing special ed services, McKinney, Vento, et cetera, we're hoping to expand bus services to other schools. Do we have a work plan and a tiering system for which schools would be allowed to transportation by moving these bell times? That is not addressed in the bar that I can find. Um, at this point, the this bell time will allow us um, to reach the efficiencies needed with the fleet that we have to serve um, the that first um, priority of students of special education, McKinney Bento, um, 504 accommodations. So we would need again. I need to be clear that we have two issues. We have a, a shortage of drivers, but. The reason when we have a full complement of drivers, we have a two tier bell time is that we need this again for transportation for all schools. Maybe not a lot of buses, but but right now special ed is primarily what we're transporting. And so um, we need this tier just to serve that um, uh, th that set of students. Once we get this taken care of, we have um, some students that um, some schools uh, that um, West Woodland Elementary for school, for instance, has been relocated um, to John Marshall, creating, you know, exacerbating a transportation issue just for that school. So we're working to find a solution um, for those students in particular. Um, we've just made a, a move as the uh, board is aware, um, of Licton Springs and um, created, you know, special transportation issues for those students. So those are high on our list and we're looking at tier using the equity tiers um, to see as we add this with adding tier one schools be a, an appropriate way of prioritizing. Um, we are so focused now uh, again, you know, governor's order was established on March 15th. Our educational model for the first set of students was finalized um, uh, uh, just last week, so we are fully focused on allocating the resources we do have to meet that first set of students and and then um, recruiting and bringing on more drivers so we can at between the um, the tiers which creates some efficiencies and moving the bell times and then more drivers are coming online which had been the plan be because again um, the district's plan prior to this was to serve the students we are talking about uh, uh, in March 29th um, and we have that basically covered. That plan did was built around a full day, not um, um, AM and PM cohorts. So right now we're, you know, rebuilding routes to cover that. We'll understand then, you know, what the excess capacity is, um, and then how how many additional drivers we've been able to bring in on board and train into the system, and then we'll again start prioritizing what further um, general education transportation we can provide. I, you know, it is probably still likely going to be fairly limited um, and we need the um, survey data that is coming back from families, both uh, information that was finalized last night for intensive service pathways and then the others to have real numbers to know what our capacity is to add. But uh, again, more specific to your question, you know the particular transportation is we've issues we've created at the particular schools by moving students um, and then uh, tier one schools was our first thought of a way to start looking at priorities. Okay, my next question. I have a couple of more, and I apologize for this, but this is very vague to me. Do we not make money on transportation for high capable cohorts, e.g., West Seattle students? Thurgood Marshall. I'm I'm sorry, Director Harris. Can you repeat the question? It's it's been my understanding that we yeah, made sounds really money. Hard. Okay, I'm hold on. Sorry, sorry. I'm doing the best I can. Uh, go ahead. It's my understanding 
that transporting HCC students under the state budget stars or whatever the heck it is we call it now, we actually are reimbursed in full, and I'm using West Seattle students that are transported to first uh, Thurgood Marshall as an example. Is that not correct? As well, we are um, trans, uh, reimbursed by the state for yellow bus transportation based on how many destinations and how many students we serve. So it is a, a bit complicated of a complicated model. So adding destinations and students. Is it a special category, sir? Um, not to my knowledge. Maybe if um, there's something I'm missing, if uh, Chief Berge is on the call and wants to speak to. I am um, not aware of, uh, of uh, special funding related to HCC, but um, I, I don't know. Again, if Chief Berge could speak. No to special that. funding for HCC. Not not for transportation. Nope. Okay. Yeah, I get misinformed. Next question is in terms of our communication to the surveys. Did we advise parents that they would not have necessarily transportation? Which I'm hearing from a great number of working families that would elect to stay remote if, in fact, they didn't have transportation guaranteed to go back to the hybrid model. Did we ask that specific question? Because I think that's a deal breaker for a great many families. My understanding is our survey instrument made it clear that um, um, trans for the survey for general education students that transportation um, was uh, could not be guaranteed and was very limited. Okay, because social media suggests otherwise. My last question is, what is our relationship with first student right now and how much are they assisting us with rehiring former drivers and putting the word out for new drivers? Um, our, I, our relationship with student has gone up and down. I think our relationship is good. Um, you know, we talked to the board about, you know, the date that we would start paying drivers again when there was still some uncertainty about when transportation services would start. Um, they, um, their uh, income is based on a services delivered per bus. So they're 100% motivated to um, bring their drivers back as quickly as they can per their driver's collective bargaining agreement. Um, it, you know, it it takes time every year to do this. And in this, you know, Drivers have made choices, um, and as we get later into the year, um, we're uh, recruiting drivers for a fairly short window that gets shorter as time progresses. It's, you know, recruiting in the fall for 10 months of work is different than recruiting in the spring for two and a half months of work. So I think they are making heaven and earth, and, and they did. They, they brought 220 drivers back, um, uh, this spring and that meets our needs for our first set of students we need to transport and they're doing what they can. We are looking at other providers and other sources, but um, I, I believe our relationship is good and they're uh, working in good faith um, to uh, to bring um, drivers back. Very glad to hear. Thank you. I'm probably going to abstain on this motion because it's so vague as far as hearing and as far as the communication to families and it and it hurts me because I've been watching transportation for 10 years very very closely and who knew we were going to have a worldwide pandemic and a governor and a state superintendent that really didn't care what the operationalized uh, cost would be both in terms of dollars and in terms of human capital. Thank you very much. Um, so if I can just clarify, Director Harris, 
this bar, as I understand it, is only about bell times, and those other items are, by approving bell times, we're not necessarily approving or not approving anything associated with tiering. I, I understand that, President Hansen, but to me, they are absolutely intrinsically linked, and I don't think that I have enough information in terms of next steps to be able to vote in the affirmative. Thank you. Director Dury. I have no questions at this time. Thank you. Director uh, Hersey. Hi, thank you. Um, I just want to say for all the parents out there that are super concerned about this, I see you and I hear you. Uh, as a second grade teacher, it's a struggle getting my eight-year-olds to fully wake up and be present at 9 a.m. And so this is going to be a significant change. And unfortunately, it's going to be one of those things that just comes along uh, as we try to reopen our buildings um, and as we push forward to that goal with our educators. There, there's going to be some change. Uh, that is necessary to make this uh, effective for everybody. My only question is, uh, in your professional opinion, um, Chief Podesta, is this a change that you see us uh, continuing to implement into uh, the fall potentially as well? Um, I would expect so. Again, this is really a return to the structure that we've had. I think for at least the last three or four years, roughly, uh, since right. we've moved to a two um, bell time system, unless we want to, you know, open up the, but there, you know, between transportation, managing school buildings and athletics and other after school activities, there's only so much overall flexibility that we have. No, I totally understand that. And I think that my only request in my next question would be, have we, um, and I probably know the answer to this, given the speed at which everything is moving. Um, but are we in the process or are we planning to do a robust equity analysis of this um, so that we can have adequate data uh, when we need to make this decision again on how well or not well this worked out for our families, but especially our black families uh, during this you know, spring as we head to the fall? I think um, we, we, you know, we had the work session a few weeks ago about transportation in general and, and the constraints and having to look um, again, and it, it's kind of the same question, how we can use our resources, right. um, our financial resources and our transportation resources um, uh, more judiciously and equity analysis would be built into that. And as you can see, bell times and scheduling have big impacts on on the resource um, and service levels that transportation can provide. And so since we're expecting all that analysis to be um, focused on an equity lens to make sure that you know, any changes we make. So I, I think we, it's, um, it will be front and center um, that this, this slice of it, how bell times and transportation costs work, and then transportation services in general, um, the transportation department, you know, the, the pandemic, um, uh, interrupted this, but was had already started to kick off a procedure to look at the whole transportation service standards um, from the perspective of equity. And again, bell times are really just, in some respects, um, an appendage to the transportation service standards. So I, I think, yes, we're, we're definitely on a path to do an equity, equity analysis and understand how transportation, its relationship to school schedules affect um, uh, black students and students uh, furthest from educational justice. That's really appreciated. Uh, can we get whenever the intersection is appropriate, whether it be Friday memo or at our next transportation work session, which I'm sure will be coming up in a matter of weeks, uh, can we get an update or just an alert when that uh, work has begun so sure. that we can track it? Thank you. Appreciate it. That's all for me. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I think I don't have any, uh, well, I guess the only question I have is um, what our anticipated um, assessment data is, and maybe that's what Director Hersey is already asking for, is when do we know what availability we're going to have based on the survey um, information we receive, which is due tonight, in case anybody has not filled out their, their survey. 
I I would expect us to have an understanding of this um, early next week. The two, we need the overall, um, you know, what is the level of students returning um, to in-person instruction? And then um, what is the um, potential split of AM and PM cohorts? Because that essentially creates another school from the perspective of transportation. Now that's two school days in one. Um, so that um, is a, you know, a big uh, consumer of resources. Um, and then as we've talked about earlier in this meeting, um, secondary um, bargaining around the secondary model is still going on. And so how those transportation needs are met uh, at middle, middle schools and, and other high schools that do use transportation now. Um, but I think we'll start to get some picture of this um, early next week and then uh, also know how many additional resources we're able to bring online. Um, do we have any, well, before I forget, I want to note something that I don't believe has been said or if it, if it was, I apologize and I missed it, but that this is based on one student per bench unless they're from the same family and that is part of the, the TA. So that it also goes to capacity. So were we to in the future have direct guidance that said um, otherwise uh, we might be able to move to um, a different model, but for now the TA dictates one student per bench. That's correct. Um, do you know the, the uh, percent by which that would increase that additional students per bench would increase our capacity? Is it just like a doubling or a third or 25%? It, it is not, it, the theoretical capacity on a full bus is either 30, you know, is either a triple or, um, or double capacity for the bus, you know, given that our, uh, again, based on our routing patterns and um, even with two tiers, the uniformity of bell times, um, our buses typically are, are across the system operating at half capacity. So there will be some points where the, the physical distancing on buses actually makes a big difference. It not, it's not enormous, but um, again, we actually need the real numbers of which students to which schools and which cohort to know. So what are, how many overloaded buses? If we could relax those parameters, um, it, if we determine that's safe, that will certainly save us at, uh, you know, save resources at the margin. It is not a wholesale game changer, we don't think. Okay. Um, and then the, um, I, I think I just want to note that um, we have, we implemented based on need for sleep for secondary children. Um, had shifted to the bell time schedule that we have now. We did have um, a, a, a three years ago, two years ago, um, I can't keep track now, but um, when we were at, some schools started at 9.30, some schools started at um, eight o'clock. Uh, we had um, three bell, three um, schedules, which provided a lot more flexibility. And I know that we have data coming in that is that is potentially we missed a year of data this last year, right? Um, we might be able to gain a little bit this year, but I think it's probably going to be not not particularly um, good data with respect to attendance. But um, I believe that there's some um, critical things we're going to need to be looking at in terms of what bell times actually work in, in different communities as well as the different age groups. And that we do have this earlier bell time on the K-5 side, to allow for a later bell time on the secondary side, which we know to be really, really necessary for those secondary students. So, um, so I just want to make that make you know kind of remind folks of, of that as well. Um, and um, I had another question, but I've I, or, um, I've I've lost it. So um, I think we've we've spent enough time on this, and um, I'm I'm I want to just state for the record that the um, the timing and the, and the rush and the way in which that that we've been forced to bring all kids back at once has in fact created inequities, and that this is one of the few ways, few tools that we have accessible to um, to try to insert some more equity back into the equation. 
and that reminds me of my last question. Any luck with um, King County Metro, if if they can help us out at, at all? And if you don't have to answer that now, we can I can get it in a Friday memo. Yes, we have had some discussions, um, and uh, they are uh, making connections for us with some of their resources, and and both on the elementary side, at least for discussion purposes, and then also helping us think about the secondary model, which is much more reliant on transportation and um, what their operating parameters are going to be and helping us think about um, challenges we might have uh, if midday transportation is required. So it's it's um, there have been constructive conversations so far. We don't you know, they haven't yielded um, huge uh, benefits yet, but we're, we're just starting that discussion. OK, great. Thank you so much. All right, um, Ms. Wilson-Jones, will you please call for the vote? Yes, just a moment. My computer has momentarily frozen, but I expect it to load in a second here. Um, Director Harris? Director Harris abstain. Director Hersey? Aye. Director Rankin? Aye. Director Rivera-Smith? Aye. Director Dury? Aye. Director DeWolf? Aye. Director Hampson? Aye. This motion has passed with a vote of six yes and one abstention. OK. Um, we will now move to action item number six, approval to procure HEPA filters for in-person instruction. May I have a motion for this item? Absolutely. I move that the school board approve the procurement of HEPA filters with any modifications deemed necessary by the superintendent to complete the procurement. I further move that the school board waive provision in policy number 1420 that board action reports will be posted to the district's website at least three days in advance of board meetings. Immediate action is in the best interest of the district. Second. This motion item has been moved by Vice President Hersey and seconded by Director Vera Smith. This item is on the agenda for introduction and action today. This item did not go to committee. Chief Podest, I believe you will be briefing us. Yes, thank you, President Hampson. Um, as uh, been discussed many times with the board, our, um, there's a uh, our safety plans related to COVID for buildings really rely on increasing ventilation um, and we are trying to achieve a standard across our whole system of um, uh, 25 cubic feet per minute per occupant in a building to bring fresh air into buildings. And we've been working hard to um, uh, make sure our uh, all HVAC systems are working as designed and um, uh, balanced in classroom in our 4000 classrooms and other spaces to achieve this standard. There are uh, vagaries of any particular building where in a particular space, um, not so much classrooms, but other spaces as well, um, where it's difficult for us to achieve that um, 25 cubic feet per minute of fresh air per person in the room. and. Our solution to that are these standalone HEPA filters, um, very fine filters, which, which clean the air in the room rather relying uh, solely on fresh air from the ventilation system. Um, we procured uh, 350 of these filters and place, placed them at spot locations in buildings as we were um, getting ready for our previous uh, return to in-person learning um, around the March timeframe. Um, we immediately made another order um, with the governor's order because again, we we're just increasing the occupancy of our buildings. We were bringing more grade bands. We wanted to make sure that we might have more spaces and more people in spaces. Um, and so um, that led to the second order of 500 units. Um, and um, we've been deliberating over the past few days as the CDC has announced guidance that um, perhaps physical distancing um, guidelines would be relaxed instead of uh, six feet of physical distancing between occupants of a room to three feet 
for perhaps um, elementary grade bands or others. Again, that would increase um, the occupancy in buildings and in rooms. And our, our goal is still to provide a certain amount of fresh air per occupant. And so that might um, create more spaces where it's difficult to achieve that with the ventilation system that's built into the building. So we want to augment it, potentially augment it with the um, standalone HEPA filters, um, which are, you know, are a, a small plug-in device, not that small actually, perhaps um, the size of a two-drawer file cabinet, um, uh, where needed and wanted to have those available. We still, you know, we are still uh, conforming with the, the six-foot guideline and um, are still thinking through if uh, occupancy were to, or we were allowed to raise the occupancy of buildings. You know, how many of these devices do we need? They obviously consume, you know, the more we deploy, the more energy we're consuming. It's another kind of maintenance and management obligation. So we're looking for as many solutions as we can. Um, to the point of the late introduction of this bar, we were really have been, are still planning um, for what is. Uh, the best solution if the if we can raise the occupancy of in our buildings and so that's why we're asking um, uh, to have this authority you know to buy uh, to procure these devices as quickly as needed they're also um, fairly highly in demand uh, in the market right now so we want to kind of have the capacity um, in hand but these are very late breaking decisions with the governor's order and the potential for perhaps um, being to occupy uh, buildings more densely um, is why uh, we've added this to the agenda so late in the game. But um, that's that's basically the thinking behind this, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Okay, Director Dole, start with you. Um, I don't have any questions, Chief Podesta. Thank you for putting to this together so quickly. Um, I read the bar and I appreciate your background. I think this obviously is just seems like a really important necessary step, particularly as we're bringing students back. So I'm um, looking forward to supporting this. Thank you for the, for the background. Director Hersey. No questions for me. Thank you. Director Dury. No questions for me. Thank you. Director Harris. No questions and happy to support this. Anything to keep our folks healthy is okay by me. Director um, Rivera-Smith. Oh, sorry for that delay. Um, yes, thank you. Um, very happy to see this come before us. I have a question though, um, Chief Podesta. I'm wondering, so this is for, um, this, this is for the purchase that we've already done of the um, portable HEPA filters and then for some additional ones um, in case we need to, in case our, our, um, we change from the six to three feet distance. Are these, because um, uh, I have HEPA filters in my home actually, and I know they need to be replaced. So is this also include the replacement of the actual filters? Um, and how long, first of all, how long will the ones that are in there last? And then is there going to be a separate order then for replacement filters? Not of the unit, but of the filter itself. Um, we are procuring um, filters as a stock of filters um, as we procure the units and we'll need to monitor the um, in the kind of the lifespan, the, the operating time of each, you know, once we understand how buildings are occupied and how many hours a day the filters are, are being used, um, those replacement filters, you know, compared to the initial purchase are relatively modest. I, I'd be surprised unless we have some omnibus procurement of lots of things related to COVID or HVAC that you would see the purchase of the of the uh, filter that gets installed. This is the the basic device is um, what will be above the procurement threshold. Okay, I see. Um, yeah, I think I don't um, have any other questions for that. Thank you, Director Rankin. Thank you. Um, 
I, I guess I wanted to confirm that this will be on like an as needed basis. You're talking about it mostly to mitigate an increase of um, airflow capacity as there are more people in the buildings. That's correct. So where and who and at what point would it be determined? I guess whose responsibility is it to determine, hey, we actually need to bring in one of these units in this space based on air movement and then do like how are people clear on um you know how to get that unit in place because these aren't a default these aren't going to be in every classroom it's an as needed thing to um to further uh increase airflow um where where the where necessary yes so uh facility operations staff our hvac um staff and who have also um uh, enlisted uh, consultants to help because just the workload of the 4,000 classrooms are are balancing systems and monitoring um, both ventilation throughput um, and uh, uh, carbon um, dioxide um, parts per million in the rooms and we'll continue to do that um, on a regular basis and then as uh, rooms are chosen and staffing is laid out and we know which students um, we'll continue to monitor once the once the buildings are occupied. Um, given that we've added a lot of grade bands with the governor's orders, it's just a lot more people more quickly. So we just uh -huh. want to make sure we had equipment on staff. But that that'll be what operating buildings is about as we return and welcome more students back to school. Okay. Yeah. I just I want people to understand that you know, if they don't see one of these in their classroom, that doesn't mean that they're missing something that um, it's it's provide it's it's layered. There's, you know, all of the HVAC systems have been updated and have MERV 13 filters where where they can. And then there's lots of if if that doesn't improve airflow, then we when then we also have this strategy. And if that doesn't, then we also have this strategy. So I, I I'm hoping that um, people understand and feel comfortable with the fact that the these systems are being checked periodically and that um, it's not a matter of throwing everything at everyone but but responding to the actual situation and same same as with PPE responding to the actual situation and meeting the need we're we're working with school leaders and you know so they understand how to place work orders or if they have questions you know the right. The initial audit and review of HVAC systems has been provided to school leaders so they understand the analysis that's done so far. Um, and then we'll all have a lot of learning when students are in buildings. Not everything is going to get laid out or people won't occupy the building exactly like we expected, so we'll need to adjust. Yep, thank you. Director Vera Smith, you have a follow up question? Um, I do. Thank you. Yes. Um, so I know the interaction nature of this item doesn't allow us to ask for additional documentation necessarily, but it, being as uh, a large portion of this item is for um, items that were already purchased, I just noticed that there is no um, there's no invoice or paperwork for that purchase that's already happened um, on this bar. So I'm, I'm wondering just for transparency, if you could supply us with that, I guess, and write a memo or your email. Um, just for again for transparency that we see that you know that's already been purchased there. Certainly, we could we can provide that. Thank you. Okay, uh, let's see, Director DeWolf, you already went. So, um, and this is um, just to clarify, this is you are asking for um, a, an approval authority level um, because one part of this authority has not actually been utilized yet but you foresee um utilizing it in the in the coming weeks correct potentially we um we made an initial order in january that was below the threshold the procurement threshold and then immediately reacted to the governor's order and placed uh, an order for another 500 units that um we are by with this bar kind of acting asking for retroactive authority for the order that was placed and then would like to have the contingent authority going forward if um, we have considerably more occupancy in buildings um, we were we've been thinking about um, the potential of the three foot um, physical distancing guideline is what 
has led us to that. And so um, if we move to that in a, a big way or make other changes, particularly um, as we see the secondary educational model, we think it'd be good to have that flexibility. But um, to date, um, we've ordered 850 units and would like to have the capacity to have order perhaps another 800. Great. Okay. Um, that's it from me. Um, so if there are no other questions, I would like to ask um, Director, I'm sorry. Um, sorry. I'm sorry, uh, President Hansen. I actually do have one, one more question and I promise it's short. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, I am wondering about uh, programs and schools that are in buildings that are not SPS buildings, like the center school in um, inside of Seattle Center. How how does that? Uh, I mean, I, I I assume and hope that principals are all still looped into the same. You know that 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 principal is the COVID site manager the same way. But are are we running into any issues of like overlap of responsibility or or holes where? Um, responsibility falls through when it's not our building? We've included um, those buildings in our walkthrough process that we're doing now. And then, you know, there are different arrangements with different landlords, if you will. And so we're working with them, you know, on whatever basis makes sense in that building um, to try to, you know, achieve the same standards um, that we have um, in our own building. The occupancy typically of those buildings, you know, whether it's interagency or the center school are, are a bit different, but mm -hmm. uh, so far, um, so good. We're, we're still working through some of those issues. Okay. And I imagine we're following in those spaces, the same sort of, um, uh, we were talking about stickers on, you know, knowing the different things for different rooms. We'll follow those even in structures that are not our whole building. Um, to the extent it makes sense. Again, some of those programs are a, a lot different um than some of our other schools but um yes trying to uh, uh, uphold as many of those standards as we can thank you okay ms wilson jones director hersey i'm on live aye director rankin aye Rivera-Smith? Aye. Director Dury? Aye. Director DeWolf? Aye. Director Harris? Aye. Director Hampson? Aye. This motion has passed unanimously. Okay. Um, so let me just, we're now about to move to uh, introduction items. I know that this has been a pretty um, uh, long board meeting and I don't want to hold things up, but if um, directors need a five minute um, recess. Yes, please. <laughs> yes, okay, five so is perfect. Okay, if we can recess at 6.58, Ms. Wilson-Jones. I mean, what did I just say? If we can recess and then reconvene at 6.58, please. Promptly.
understanding the successful partnership between Seattle Public Schools and the City of Seattle Department of Education and Early Learning to continue funding and to expand preschool classrooms and SPS. Um, I'm reminded of uh, right now, maybe in this time, March 2014, um, as a principal of South Shore Pre-K-8 School, I had the opportunity with former Early Learning Director and now Executive Director of Curriculum Assessment and Instruction, Cashel Toner, to attend a three-city tour of Boston, Washington, D.C., and Jersey City to attend a preschool study mission trip and visit some of the finest preschool models in the country. Six years ago, we began this innovative program by funding three preschool classrooms. This year, we're poised to continue supporting our current 29 classrooms and expand to five new sites for a total of 34 classrooms. This means $9,178,000 um, in investment, 89 teaching positions funded by this partnership. Under the leadership of the Early Learning Department, this program has expanded the opportunities for research-based and inclusive all-day preschool program throughout the city and district. Currently, we are serving 544 students overall and will serve 644 students next year. 90 of these students have IEPs and participate in our SPP, Seattle Preschool Plus, and Head Start Plus programs. Seattle Public Schools and Deal share a commitment to high-quality early learning and to expanding access to inclusive programming. Each year, our preschool programs ensure our youngest learners are more ready for kindergarten by consistently meeting and exceeding on our whole child assessments and providing foundational opportunities that support their education and future. You will notice the bar indicates $7.6 million. Indeed, our overall expansion budget will be $9.1 million due to an increase in per pupil funding. For the April 7th board meeting, the changes will be posted. Now let's talk specifically about this $9.1 million investment and what it will fund. It will fund the continuation of 29 currently funded classrooms and add five new classrooms, four Head Start um, Seattle Preschool Plus and one um, Seattle Preschool Plus, four Head Start expansion sites serving predominantly students furthest from educational justice from Martin Luther King Junior Elementary School, Wing Luke, Cascadia, and Northgate Elementary. These programs will become full day programs from the previous day model. In response to overall lack of SPS preschool opportunities in the central region, we plan to open one new SPP program in the Magnolia Elementary School's newly renovated building wing. With, the, with it, it holds the potential to expand in the future to additional developmental preschool, preschool um, classrooms. In alignment with our Seattle Excellence Strategic Plan, early learning's expansion priorities include increasing opportunities in our 13 focus schools, our Title I schools, Head Start full day programming, and inclusive special education opportunities throughout the district to ensure access to safe, warm, and engaging, high quality early learning environments that develop the talent, identity, voice, and agency of our students furthest from educational justice with the focus on African American boys. This year, our SPP and Head Start SPP classrooms enrolled 249 students of color furthest from educational justice, which made up 50% of overall enrollment with 12 students served in our McKinney Bento services. We have Mr. Dwayne Chappelle, who is the very fine director of the Department of Education and Early Learning here. And so Dwayne, uh, Mr. Chappelle, I'd love to invite you to have any comments. Yes, uh, thank you, Dr. Scarlett. Um, uh, good evening to you. Good evening, school board and, and superintendent. Uh, so, you know, I'm aware, I am grateful for this partnership. We are grateful for this partnership with Seattle Public Schools on preschool. I'm super excited to expand to a total of, as Dr. Scarlett mentioned, 34 Seattle Public School SPP classrooms for the 2021-22 school year. Um, Seattle Public Schools is our largest partner with Seattle Preschool Program in our Seattle Preschool Program network. And um, they represent, you guys represent about a quarter of all of our Seattle Preschool 
um, program classroom. So super thankful for this. Um, we're also appreciative of the district's work to make remote learning as meaningful and engaging as possible or for families this year. The Seattle Preschool Program Plus continues to be something that we're extremely or very proud of. And again, this partnership is really is really a bright spot um, for our FEP, as uh, Board President um, Hampson mentioned earlier, our FEP levy investments. Um, we also know that the focus on students further some educational justice has been your priority. I know that there are several um, points throughout this educational pipeline where our students further some educational justice and our African-American students are lost. And these points really present an opportunity to uh, continue with our investments in African-American children and youth and those further some educational justice. And as, as Dr. Scarlett just mentioned, um, these first years or the first opportunity is in the early years. Um, I just cannot say um, uh, more than or should I say there's so much I could say, but we all know that the access to high quality preschool is key to ensuring that our scholars are equipped to spread their, their brilliance as they um, blossom throughout their educational journey. And all of that to say, I'll stop there, is that I'm just extremely excited, excited for our partnership um, on behalf of our scholars. So um, I'll pause and just to let you know that I do, we do have uh, Monica Liang Aguie, she's um, our early learning um, division director um, on as well. Thank you so much. And I'm going to turn this over to um, Director uh, Rankin, um, who's the head of our um, student services um, curriculum instruction to start off um, our board questions and comments. Thank you. Um, are, so are we going to go through, are we going to talk about the promise part today or are we focusing on the preschool part today? This is preschool. Pre oh, funding for preschool service this is right there. Sorry. Yep. Um, thank you. <laughs> um, I know this is a, you know, I remember when this was first being voted on and enacted for the first time in Seattle. And um, access to high quality preschool is such an important, uh, such an important thing to provide for for uh, future academic success, for for support for working families, support for just um, you know I, I don't want to say kindergarten readiness, but um, um, helping just helping kids socialize and and the early development stuff. Um, uh, so I don't have any questions at this time. I do have. Well, it could be a question, but I don't think there's an answer to it right now. So I'll make it as a comment, which is uh, that I really look forward to the day that I hope comes soon where we don't have SPP and SPP plus where all children are welcome and served at any and all preschool sites, regardless of ability or disability. And uh, my apologies, Director Rankin, this actually came through um, ANF. Should I start with Director Hersey? So I'll go to him next. I was I was wondering. I'm like, how does she not know that? So my uh, apologies. That's okay. I mean, I I know what this is obviously, but I was surprised to be called to go first because I was like, this didn't come through me. Because you had just taken a bite. Okay, Director Hersey, you're up. <laughs> Vice President Hersey, excuse me. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> I appreciate it. Uh, I actually don't have any questions on this item, um, so we can move on to the next director. I'm just super excited to continue the partnership with Dio and thankful for your time here with us uh, tonight, Brother Chappelle, and just excited to continue to work together and get these things done in the interest of our kids. Okay, so um, let's go now to uh, Director Dury. I have no questions, thank you. Okay, uh, and then to Director Harris. Thank you. Uh, greetings, Wayne. It's good to hear your happy voice and and uh, collaboration. Um, SPP Plus. What's the ratio of the new programs between SPP and SPP Plus? Uh, thank you, uh, Board um, Harris. Good to hear your voice as well, uh, Monica. Um, let me let's see if Monica has that. If we don't have it on hand right now, 
Um, what I can do is like I, what I what I've done before is get that information for you and send it back over for everyone to view. But Monica, are you on? Do you know that um, answer? Yes. Hi. Good evening, Director Harris. Good to hear your voice. Um, we have 19 plus classrooms coming on at um, at SPS next year out of 34. So just a little over 50 percent, 55 percent. Happy to hear. Next question. Do we still have the 25% holdback, SPS being the bank for the city of Seattle? We have not had the 25% holdback in a while. It's been reduced to 15% for a number of years. And yes, we still do have that performance pay though. And do you have that performance data banking 15% uh, for the e city every of Seattle for all of your partners? Yes, we do. And and um, and Seattle Public Schools has achieved 100% of their performance pay over the years. So. so then the obvious question is, why can't we remove that piece of the contract? That is the that is the ongoing debate, uh, Director Harris. Um, I will let my boss uh, take that one on. And so uh, thank you, Di uh, Director Harris, for the question. As you know, I, I want to make sure that there that the opportunities for um, growth and improvement and, all, and everyone that we partner with is there. And, and as of right now, it's something that I've been committed to, to making sure that uh, um, we're using it as, as an opportunity to, to expand on what the lessons that are learned from the CBOs and the providers that we partner with. And so right now it is it's, it's, it's part of our performance pay. I continue to, uh, to discuss it um, internally, but it's something that I'm committed to and just making sure that folks get a, a, a opportunity to leverage this performance pay that they um, are uh, um, subject to receiving. And there's so many positives that I can go on and on forever, but I, I don't want to waste this time, but I'm happy to dive deeper with you in a one-on-one -on -one or a small session to talk more about it, uh, Director. Happy to do that, and I would suggest that it wasn't part of the uh, funding mechanisms that the voters approved, as it has not been since the beginning, and perhaps the next mayor will uh, choose to trust the Seattle Public Schools as the trusted partner that we are. Thank you. Thank you. Director, uh Sorry, Director Vera Smith. Thank, thank you. Um, I would likewise um, love to be part of that conversation. Um, I'd, I'd like to know more about this performance pay and how that works. Um, um, so um, if you could let me in, that would be great. Um, but I won't hold up this bar necessarily for that. I know that's um, kind of a separate thing that we talked about. Um, as far as this uh, action item goes, I am really excited about the increase in the inclusive um, preschool classrooms we'll have. I had the honor of um, touring the museum Luke facilities and they're beautiful and can't wait to um, get students in there and have the community get the advantage of that facility. So I don't have any more questions. Uh, we talked a lot about this in committee. So thank you. I'll pass to the next director. Director Rankin, I'm sorry, we already went, did Director Rankin. Uh, director DeWolf. Um, I don't have any questions at this time. Thank you. And I just will underscore this issue comes up every year. I know, uh, Dwayne, I appreciate all the work you do for our, our, both the district and the city. Uh, and I know that this question from Director Harris comes up every time we have this conversation. And it is not because we are trying to, to be annoying, but it's because we actually have a concern about it. And so I just underscore that, that you know, this is not us nagging you because we like to nag you. We, we, are, we are doing this because we, we don't believe that it's within the bounds of the partnership that we, the trusting partnership that we have, and it just feels a little paternalistic. So I appreciate all the work you do, and I'm excited to support this. Thank, thank, thank you, you, Director. Uh, so that goes to me, and um, love this. Yeah, I love the preschool program. We're not talking about promise this time, but love that program as well. I think this is some of the best work that um, the city and district have done together. Um, I don't have a problem with it. it being in our in our buildings, I think it's fantastic uh, partnership. Um, uh, happy to see the increasing equity focus. Um, yeah, we're we're and and I will just say we're going to have to have some deeper conversations about this um, 
And I hope some smarter conversations about the performance pay. We're looking at about $7 million in underspend in our buildings. And a lot of that actually is in performance pay, including at Mercer Middle School. So um, it it puts our, our um, staff in, in, in an awkward decision-making place. And I think it's... Uh, we need to figure out ourselves how we need, uh, as a district, how do we want to optimize um, decision making at buildings so that they're making the best decisions for student outcomes, and then how do we communicate with our partners, such as at Deal, to make sure that that um, our relationship also supports that. And and I think we're kind of in a um, in a in a tough spot with that right now. So. Um, all that being said, I appreciate it. Oh, it's always good to have you come and, and present to us, and I really appreciate you. I mean, we're not in person, but um, uh, good to see you um, uh, with us. And, um, and the, again, the growth in this program is, is tremendous and so appreciated by our communities. Um, and we actually um, have had some other, uh, there's other pieces of it, um, that have to do with groceries that are brought every week. Um, there's really some tremendous benefits um, throughout the, the city for this program. So um, thank you for that continued good work. Um, and with that, we can move on to the next introduction item. Thank you so much for coming. And thank you, Dr. Scarlett. Hello, everybody. Good evening. Um, I'm Consul Pedroza, Chief of Student Support Services. Um, uh, I'm here to uh, introduce this board action report. Um, it is for approval uh, due to amendments needed to the original contract submitted previously. These contracts are over the amount uh, previously approved by the board uh, due to a number of additional students um, added to each of the individual contract rosters. Uh, these contracts are for required services for many of our students within special education during this 2020-2021 uh, school year. This motion is to request approval for the unanticipated increases to each of these contracts. I also would like to just have it noted that uh, we did correct the amounts for clarification and transparency. So you will see in the bar uh, in, with, with the original contract amount, the additional amounts required, and then the current contract amount needed. Thank you. Okay, thank you for just jumping right in there, Dr. Pedrosa. Um, this came through ANF on March 15th uh, and was um, put forth for approval. Uh, so, uh, Vice President Hersey, would you like to start off our comments? Sure. Uh, we had a robust conversation about this in committee. It is pretty straightforward. I appreciate the work that's gone into it, and we'll pass to the next director. Thank you, uh, Director Dury. No questions at this time, thank you. Director Harris? Yeah, um, we've heard now for five separate years and Dr. Pedrosa, I appreciate that you just took over this division last year. But for five separate years, we've heard that Seattle Public Schools wanted to figure out a way to de deliver these services in-house. And I well appreciate that this last year is an anomaly because of the pandemic. But are we making any progress on that? Yes, we have made some progress. One of the areas that we, you know, there's a lot of services and there's uh, various disabilities within our system. Uh, one of the progress areas where we actually now serve more students is in the area um, of behavioral supports. We've hired more behavioral support staff. We still need to do some improvement in that work to make sure that we are still removing those bias and those decisions. But that's some, one of the areas that we have done that. Um, it's it's a it's a long process. It's not going to be one thing because, as you know, um, we, all of our students have unique services. Um, and there's um, and all of our schools have complex needs as well, but we are working on it. Do we have any sense of ETA to where we could open up a, a pilot program? Um, that's something I actually would love to talk about. It'd be interesting. Maybe we could talk about that in committee um, to discuss more some maybe because we're going to be having a special education update. I'm going to note this because I think it's a it's a broader conversation that we could have to discuss what we could do to um, start those processes. Are, are you saying that those processes have not been started? We have, we've, we actually are, we do, we have some still contracts 
Um, but as you know, many of the increase of the contracts currently are, or many of them are pandemic related. Um, and we actually have started uh, serving most of our own students. Uh, so we've done both. Um, but I would like to, uh, we can talk about how we, how, what you're proposing uh, in, a, in a conversation in committee so that our team can work on, the, on some of the things that you're suggesting. I know we've talked with um, a director, Hampson, as well, about this, this notion about contracts and maybe how to do them a little differently, moving them forward through ANF. We've talked about that as well. Thank you so much. Okay, I'm gonna to move to uh, Director Rankin. Thank you. Um, yeah, I would like to talk about this in committee or in other um, environments. Uh, and I would also um, say as sort of sort of a not necessarily in contrast to what Director Harris was saying, but until we can show that we're not restraining kids for behavior or discipline, I do not believe that we should attempt to bring students back who have higher behavioral needs, quite honestly. Thank you, uh, Director Rose Smith. Um, um, we've talked about this a lot in committee. Thank you for the um, updates added to the bar that did add clarification to the item and uh, how much money we're actually talking about. So. Um, Thank you for that. Otherwise, I have no questions or comments. Thank you. Director DeWolf. No questions at this time. Thanks, Dr. Pedrosa. Thank you. Um, I don't have any questions. Thank you so much. Uh, Thank you. And let's move to, oops. Introduction item number four. Nope. It's number three. Uh, amending board policy number 6220 procurement. This came through ANF on March 15th for approval. And Chief Financial Officer Jolyn Berge, I believe you will be briefing us. Good evening again, directors. Uh, this bar, if approved, would increase the threshold of board approval for purchases and non construction contracts, uh, for construction contracts, and for contract amendments. And these changes are outlined on page one of the bar. By way of background, this policy change was initiate, initiated by President Hampson during her tenure as chair for the Audit and Finance Committee um, and continued forward under Vice President Hershey's leadership as the new ANF chair. Because this bar impacts the work of both the operations and the ANF committees, this was taken to both committees. Both committees expressed strong support for this policy change. Um, I would say that Director Rivera-Smith had some questions that we have addressed. We've added the background language requested to the bar, outlining the policy changes more clearly. You also had questions about Superintendent Procedure 6220SP.F, and we have left the revenue thresholds for approval unchanged in that procedure, as they do relate to an, another policy, 6114. And then uh, we also reviewed, uh, per your request, Procedure H, um, and updated references and titles, et cetera. President Hampson in committee, uh, you had asked the dollar value of the work hours saved by this change, which we estimate to be about $263,000 a year. Uh, and finally, when this policy was first drafted in 2012, there were very limited administrative procedures for internal routing and approval of contracts. What was implemented significantly changed how contracts and procurements are processed and approved. Under these changes, only three people can sign contracts and there is and has been a strict process for administrative review and approval. These proposed changes um, do include, uh, you know, some counterbalance, uh, increasing the threshold, but also continuing uh, quarterly reporting of all procurements and contracts that would exceed the $250,000 mark. So anything between the $250,000 and the new limit would still be reported on a quarterly basis during the to the audit and finance committee in a written report. And with that, I'm happy to take com uh, questions. Okay, let's go to Director Hersey, who is the chair of the audit and finance committee. 
Thank you very much. Again, this was uh, discussed robustly in committee. My main questions were just going to be making sure that the uh, comments that Director Rivera-Smith had made in committee have been addressed. Um, but thank you so much, uh, CFO Berge, for uh, teeing that up for us. So we should be able to move a little bit more quickly. Really appreciate it. We can pass to the next director. Okay, and I'm going to go to uh, Director DeWolf. Do you want to comment on this next? Yeah, thank you so much, President Hampson. I, um, I just want to echo uh, Director Hersey. <laughs> uh, we did have a discussion on this in our operations committee, and I really appreciated the process that the district, and by the district, I mean Chief Berge and her team, uh, went through to um, keep the committees informed about this policy update. Um, I really appreciate that both of our, uh, our committees were engaged on this topic. Um, and uh, I know Chief Podesta, we, we had a little analysis about our meetings and um, to give a little bit of an understanding of what the, the policy change that we're, just, we're talking about now would actually mean for our meetings and efficiency and for staff time and actual staff dollars that it takes to do the work to bring contracts that are $251,000 and above, you know, $250,000 and above to each of our meetings. And I, I really uh, appreciate and understand that the staff time uh, focused on putting these smaller contracts through actually does take up a lot of time. So I'm really personally very excited to see this come through for efficiency. I think um, our, our district and our, and our work would be really helped by kind of improving the workflow. Um, and I'm really excited to see this policy update and I look forward to supporting it. Thank you. Okay, and then we'll go um, to, uh, let's go to Director Rivera-Smith next. Hi, thank you. Um, thank you so much for all the, the updates and changes to the bar. I know I, I had a lot of questions there, but but I, I think it, was, it really did um, just kind of clarify the areas that need to be there. Um, there was a concern with the um, policy change that had not been made that was referenced in item F or page, yeah, that letter on the F. So thank you for that. Um, I think that, I think you spoke a little bit to it already, but if you could just explain more, because I think one of the biggest concerns people might have about this item is the, the lack of oversight the board will have going forward on a certain dollar um, amount items. So, and I know in committee, you explained how there are a lot of more um, safeguards and checks and balances that did not exist when this um, policy was last updated. So maybe you could explain a little bit more about how we can still be sure that there is adequate oversight of our items. Sure. I, um, President Hampson, I know Director DeWolf has his hand up. I don't know if you want to go to him first or should I respond? Uh, are you okay if I just let her respond, Director DeWolf? Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Um, so the, the process right now, there's three people who can sign contracts depending on level. Um, Amy Fleming, the accounting director, can sign up to 75000 Then myself, um, I can sign up, up to 100000 um, where I can sign for Amy and then the superintendent and the superintendent can have a designee. Those are the only three people who can do um, contract approval right now. And there is a whole threshold of approvals where you have to go through your department. It has to come through Amy's office and accounting department. We make sure that there's budget, that they've got the paper, proper paperwork filed, that they've done appropriate procurement. And then it comes to myself and or to the superintendent, depending on the threshold for um, additional sign offs and review. Okay. That does, I mean, that is reassuring, definitely, for those for, um, for the process there. I'm wondering if that is um, written anywhere, where, where we could find that process laid out? Or yeah, it's in one of the procedures. So the procedure lays that out. There's a whole matrix. Um, so let me find out. Uh, that is, I think it's B or C. <laughs> Uh, it's B, 6220 SPB, and it outlines the execution process and who has approval authority and what approvals it has to go through. There's a matrix that's attached in your packet. Wonderful. Um, do we have any built-in audits at any point for kind of just oversight of this change? If we make this change, at what interval will we look at it to just to make sure that it is that it is not leading to any um, unintentional or, you know, any items that were missed and lacked the oversight they needed? Well, I suspect what will happen is 
accounting will have the reporting responsibility to report out to audit and finance. But I would suspect that this would be something that internal audit would also take a look at as a new policy change and to confirm that we have done that quarterly reporting. Okay, okay well, um, I know we get one more look at this uh, for, for action. So thank you, no more questions. Director Dewolf, you had a follow up? Yeah, thank you. I just want to be really clear. Director Rivera Smith said something that is not true. The board, we are elected to have oversight over this district. We will continue to have oversight over this district. This is merely about efficiency. And in fact, the improvements to the process are laid out in procedure and the district has taken the necessary steps to improve their process to hopefully prevent the types of missteps that took place in the past. But this does not relinquish our oversight role. In fact, I think we are probably, uh, more, we have more oversight than we ever have. So I just want to be very clear that that assertion is not true. We still maintain our elected duty oversight of this district. This is about efficiency. Thank you. Okay, um, I'm going to go ahead and go next since I, I did, um, I want to point out a couple of, of things that um, brought this to the fore. One is the extent to which uh, board directors as a result of this policy end up pretty deep in, in what we like to call the weeds with respect to uh, approvals um, without necessarily any requisite experience to, to bring to bear. Um, and we have in part remedied that by bringing in some additional um, uh, using the authority that we have within our committee structure to actually bring in a public advisor um, and, and, and we'll bring in an additional public advisor. Um, and and that, that helps and that position goes on past the, the tenure of, of a board member in the Audit and Finance Committee. But we also have strengthened um, the, the, the breadth of our Audit and Finance, um, I mean, sorry, our audit um, uh, team and, and structure and um, that was one thing I wanted to make sure that we did prior to implementing this. The um, range of approval levels for school district boards throughout the, the country of similar sizes is between 50,000 and a million dollars. We're kind of smack dab in the middle and th I, there isn't a lot of really clear data. I think this is something that we should continue to look at. Um, it's it's not as if once we put this in place that it can never be considered again, um, but that we don't have any evidence to demonstrate that we're as we as a board are adding value. And in fact, the the amount of time that it takes for staff to put together board action reports for dollar amounts that I think even at five hundred thousand, it's like something like 0.03 percent of our total um, budget. I don't know if I did that math right. That's my calculation for it, 500,000. We're as a $1.5 billion um, budget. That's not our operating budget. That's our total budget for the year. But um, so $500,000 is, is a pretty, pretty low bar relative to the, the scope of the, of the overall budget. And that is part of why I feel very comfortable. In addition to the fact that we do have very strong um, uh, procedures in place, staff level procedures, and, and we through our um, risk management and an audit um, system can can choose to look at those um, and prioritize those for analysis at any point and and that that allows us to provide continue providing that oversight so um, I'm excited to bring this forth um, I think that the weight uh, it was actually something that director um, um, that that the Former director, uh, director Mack and I had talked about um, wanting to, particularly for operations, because of of the the sheer volume of um, of items that come before the the board that are operations um, that really just take up too much of our um, of staff and our time and discussion, and yet for which we're not necessarily providing any expertise or value or particular oversight. If you don't really know what you're looking at, it's difficult to provide that oversight. And we have quite a few excellent structures, thanks to Director Mack and others, um, staff in place that, that do in fact provide those oversight. So, so we have a lot of different ways of, of keeping track of um, and, and ch providing checks and balances to those structures. And as long as we continue to 
utilize those and monitor those um, and hold ourselves accountable to those and hold staff accountable to those, then I, I feel really confident about this. So I'm really relieved to see this coming forward and um, and and I think it'll it'll um, create some some space in our um, relationship with staff um, to show them the extent to which we do trust them to do their their jobs. Um, and so then I'm going to go to uh, Director Drury. Do you have any questions? Um, I don't have any questions. I just I have one comment that I appreciate um, creating efficiencies in in systems and, and within budgets. And so um, I look forward to learning more about this as we go forward as well. Okay, Director Harris. I I wish that I could agree, but I can't. Um, I think that we signed up for $250,000, not $500,000. And yes, it takes time, but yes, that's what we are elected to do. A uh, couple other comments and reflections. Um, and thank goodness for Chief Financial Officer JoLynn Berge. She, in the past, has discovered um, less than ethical behavior on the part of non-current staff where they change smaller contracts so that it wouldn't go over $250,000 so they abused their authority. That's been rectified. But there's been an awful lot of contracts in the last 10 years that were for $248,000 or for $245,000 or for $249,000 to escape the uh, oversight of the board. And we were all elected because folks expected us to keep our eyes on the prize here and it's time consuming for us certainly and it's time consuming for staff certainly but as chip o'neill i think said you know a comma and a zero here it all adds up and i think in terms of rebuilding trust with our voters and our communities we need to keep it where it is thank you Director Rankin. Again, like I said, always surprised when it's my turn, no matter when it is. Um, uh, thank you. Yeah, I um, I do support this and, and understand. Um, you know, when we're talking about projects as large, you know, the projects that come to us for approval are things like, um, you know. Uh, lock sets for doors for all the buildings in the in the school or in the district and um, you know literally hardware and you know because just because of the volume uh, at which things have to be procured um, I uh, I feel oh the, by the way sorry the uh, BTA and Beck's oversight committee is in support of this um, and they see a lot of the items um, and have a lot of knowledge around um, the different expenditures and uh, things that would be considered under this new threshold. Um, I want to echo, I guess, uh, I think President Hansen's comments that policy, since this this limit was enacted of $250,000 and, and the incidents that were referred to by um, Director Harris, policy has changed a lot and procedure has changed a lot. And so I really believe that there is more oversight in more appropriate places now um, than uh, than there was at the time when issues did arise, partly because those issues arose, there were steps taken to um, address it and prevent it from happening again. Um, I, you know, my, it's, it's interesting to me to see some of the different items, but I also fully appreciate that it does take a lot of staff time to bring those things before us. And there was a comment made about, you know, the the board wanting to just hand out money freely. Well, it's still, it, it's not, the checkbook's not open. It still goes through a procurement process and has many trusted staff, staff folks go over it. And as um, Chief Berge said, there's, it, there's not a lot of leniency in who can sign so um, it's it's not it's not throwing out um, throwing out uh, our capability to oversee. It actually is in a lot of ways strengthening the systems that we already have, as I see it, and a good use of time and funds by uh, tightening up some of the 
steps that are mostly sort of, um, and not ceremonial, but uh, yeah. Anyway, I think I made my point. Okay, I went very much out of order on this. Did I miss anybody? I see Director Harris, did you have another comment? No, ma'am, I'm good, thank you. Okay, all right, so uh, we're gonna move on. All right, um, your book RFP bar. So Dr. Keisha Scarlett, Chief Academic Officer. It said that your books are a visual time capsule of memories. And so this bar is asking the school board to authorize the superintendent to execute a one year contract extension with Herf Jones in the amount not to exceed $400,000 and may execute two optional annual extensions, each in the amount not to exceed $400,000, each for a total amount not to exceed $1.2 million over three years for the management and classroom support of middle school and high school yearbooks. We originally brought this version of this bar last year. This is a request to get authority for three years for this contract. That said, we continue to take very seriously the annual review and approval process we conduct internally. As we shared at SSCNI committee, we are responding to feedback on Herf Jones to ensure that their performance meets school staff expectations. The extension of the contract beyond this coming year would still be dependent on the district being satisfied with Herf Jones's performance. The biggest issue with respect to equity in this contract that has been raised is about affordability. There was an important conversation last year and Director Harris noted during SSCNI, our, during our last meeting, that it is important to revisit this conversation with regard to this contract. The district has taken the following steps to address affordability. The district-wide contract takes advantage of volume pricing. A uniform cost per school is guaranteed that will keep the prices of yearbooks down. Smaller high schools can take advantage of middle school pricing, lowering the baseline cost per book. In addition, some SPS middle and high schools have made yearbooks available to all students by subsidizing the cost. We are learning from this approach as well as other school approaches and working to determine whether a district-wide approach would be helpful. At the March SSCNI meeting, the committee moved this forward for consideration given, I believe, the desire to have a conversation about affordability related to your books and the connection to our shared efforts to promoting equity, particularly racial equity. In addition, I want to respond briefly to the comment made during public comment today about this contract. In brief, we have had to follow the formal procurement process last year, and this included advertising the RFP in the Daily Journal of Commerce, posting in the Builders Exchange and on the Seattle Public Schools website. In addition, in an effort to diversify the vendor pool, we, contra we contacted Tabor 100, an association of entrepreneurs, business advocates, who are committed to economic power, educational excellence, and social equity for African Americans in the community at large, and also the Office of Minority and Women's Business Enterprises. We thank you for your consideration of this bar. I would like to note that we have Dr. Caleb Perkins, Executive Director of College and Career Readiness, with us this evening, who can help with questions. With that, I will take any questions you have. President Hansen, you are muted. Sorry, Director Ankin, you're up. You're okay, okay. I was, I was thought that's what you this, said, but I wasn't sure. Um, this time no, you I, are up. Yes, I'm sorry. I didn't realize <laughs> I was muted. Yeah, thank you. Go ahead. That's okay. Um, yeah, I don't have any questions as this we had the opportunity to discuss this in student services curriculum and instruction committee, but I do want to re emphasize for folks that this is not a new contract and it's it's an extension of a current one. So there wasn't a whole new RFP process 
this time, but the process that Dr. Skylet described um, was used the last time, just for clarification. Thank you, uh, Director Rivers. I'm sorry, Director DeWolf. No questions here. Thank you for that um, update, Dr. Scarlett. Director uh, Rivera Smith. No questions. Thank you. Director Harris. Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Scarlett, and also uh, Dr. Perkins for the robust conversation we did have in CCSNI. Um, Dr. Scarlett, you mentioned that uh, some schools subsidize the cost. How do they do that? Are they PTSA funds or what? Or is it different for each school? And which schools and how many schools? That's a great question. Dr. Perkins, are you with us to address that question? Yeah, I, I have a partial, I don't have um, every single middle and high school, but we have been studying um, some examples with Eagle Staff and with Roosevelt and others. And yes, it is generally PTSA funds that help uh, subsidize as well as some schools give the option for uh, students who can pay to also pay into a fund when they are paying for their yearbook to help their classmates. Um, we could get a more systematic approach, but that's that's uh, what we're learning. And as it said, as Dr. Scarlett shared, we're uh, exploring the option of having a district-wide approach to make that more uh, accessible for all. Well, I sure would appreciate more information and I, I appreciate the additional information since CCSNI. Uh, thank you for that. And if we could figure out a matrix in your spare time in the middle of the pandemic, right? Uh, now. Several years ago, um, we heard from an entrepreneur, an African-American male who had a um, interest in providing yearbooks, and he felt that uh, by just rolling over this contract on a regular basis, even though we've done RFPs, and I appreciate that we followed the letter of the law last year, um, what became of our conversations with Tabor 1000? and MBWE as far as opening this up to opening this up to other uh, contractors and and frankly soliciting them under our race and equity uh, goals. Yeah, the, the uh, points that Dr. Scarlett made are probably the fullest uh, understanding I have. So which is that we we went through the process as guided by the procurement and contracting office to reach out to, to those those groups. We do have to be careful, obviously, as I know you know, Director Harris, in terms of just making sure we're reaching out in a way that, that all people can uh, access. Um, so there may be additional steps we can take, but um, we followed the guidance that the contract office gave us in terms of trying to diversify the vendors through the Tabor 1000 piece and the, and the Office of uh, Women and Minority Businesses. And when did we do that? We did that uh, as part of the RFP process for when this contract, as Director Rankin just uh, reminded us, um, approximately in January of, of 2020. I, I'd have to go look back at exactly the dates of when we, we did this last year. Well, I bet, and I don't know that you were here then, Dr. Perkins, and I don't believe that Dr. Scarlett was in the position she holds now, but I have to tell you, uh, the archivist can bring up the uh, information from this gentleman, and it was frankly okay. very disturbing. And I just hope that we um, are in touch with Tabor 1000 and MWB. So just, just to be clear, it's Tabor 100. Um, just, just to be clear. Thank you for that. I appreciate the correction and the, uh, but, but rolling over contracts when we have race and equity goals um, and we haven't reached back in over a year when these issues were brought up to us is concerning to me. Thank you. Um, I do recall that uh, there was an exchange in 2019 with the gentleman uh, around the contract for that year. And um, I believe uh, Dr. Kenosha at the time reached out to him to on how to connect with these other um, uh, networks. Um, uh, that's for what that's worth. 
I don't know if that addresses and all the can concerns. I appreciate it. It's not just one person. It's a systemic Understood. issue for me. I appreciate Understood. it immensely. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay. Um, Let's see, where are we in the list? Um, Director uh, Rivera-Smith, please. Um, I believe I already gave, already passed. I have no questions or comments. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. Am I going the wrong direction? Uh, Director Dury? No questions at this time. Thank you. Director um, Hersey? None for me. Thank you. Uh, Director DeWolf, did I already capture you? Yes, at the top of the top Great, of the thanks. Okay, thank you so much, um, uh, Director Perkins and uh, Dr. Scarlett. Uh, and and the, just FYI, the delay here is I'm just bringing back up the form to... Um, Find out the next item. Direction item number five, approval to rename the Southwest Athletic Complex SWAC to the Nino Cantu Southwest Athletic Complex. This came through ops on March 11th for approval. Uh, over to you, Chief Podesta. Thank you, President Hampson. Um, this proposal uh, to rename the Southwest Athletic Complex to the Nino Cantu uh, athletic, Southwest Athletic Complex has been jointly proposed by um, uh, Chief South International High School Principal Aida Fraser Hammer and um, uh, Denny Middle uh, Denny International Middle School Principal Jeff Clark, um, who have uh, and it's meant to honor a groundskeeper at the athletic complex who um, served with distinction. Uh, for nearly two decades. I believe Principal Clark is with us um, tonight, and I will let him um, speak to um, what Mr. Cantu meant to the community, the school community, and athletes and others at this complex. Thank you so much. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Jeff Clark, proud principal of Denny International Middle School. Uh, principal Aida Fraser Hammer was uh, previously on the call um, when we hit the seven o'clock uh, time frame, she needed to uh, shift over to her PTSA meeting. Um, I do have a colleague with me as a part of our proposal that we're very excited about tonight. And it's a real honor to introduce to you the best kitchen manager in the whole city of Seattle, Miss Dory Fazio Young. Ms. Dory, are you still logged on with us? There we go. I forgot to unmute. Sorry. Great. Thank you, Ms. Clark. Thank you, Director, Superintendent Juno, and everybody else. My name is Dory Fazio Young. I'm the lunch lady and the doc foreman at Denny International Middle School. <laughs> Nino Cantu was my best friend, but he wasn't just my best friend, he was everybody's best friend. He served skillfully at as our community as groundkeeper at the Southwest Athletic Complex at SWAC and the campuses of Denny and South for 18 years, from 2000 to 2018. Mr. Cantu made many amazing things possible at SWAC as head groundskeeper and lead staff member for the, and he was also the lead staff member for the events at the stadium. Community events supported by Nino were a wide array of popular activities, including countless Seattle public schools, parks and athletic events, the Special Olympics for years, high school graduation ceremonies for Chief South and West Seattle High School, the All City Band Summer Jams, our East African community run Somali soccer games, and the firefighter games, and the National Guard used to come there and do their drills. In addition to being head groundskeeper, Nino joyfully described himself as an artist with the grounds of Swack, Denny, and Self as his canvas. It seems as if he knew everyone by name and story. It was his positive attitude that made him a mentor to many students and gardeners from all around the city. 
a friend to all people, and a leader within the community. Tragically, Nino Cantu passed away on October 12th, 2018. Nino invited everyone into that complex as if it were his home. He, you came to the complex, it was like, come on in, have a cup of coffee, let's have fun. That's the way Nino was. Nino took in the kids, every kid from all the sports, sporting events, they had nicknames. He'd get on the loudspeaker, make them feel like they were the most important thing. So please, I think this would be just a wonderful thing for the children in our community and our community to have this, have his name on the stadium. That way his legacy would never die. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Dory. Uh, community engagement. This proposal has received incredibly strong and enthusiastic support every time discussed throughout our community. Specifically, the support from Denny International Middle School community. Proposal was shared at our PTSA board meeting on October 21st, 2020. All PTSA officers were incredibly supportive. The proposal was also shared and discussed in English, Spanish, and Somali at the Denny School PTSA meeting on October 27th, 2020. More than 50 families and staff attended the meeting. Many enthusiastically supportive comments were shared. Everyone in attendance supported the idea. The proposal was also shared at the Denny All Staff meeting on November 18th, 2020, once again receiving very strong support. To further seek staff input and support, an anonymous survey was given asking staff if they supported the proposal. 87 staff members have indicated their support. Support from the Chief South International School community. Proposal to rename the complex, the Nino Cantu Southwest Athletic Complex was raised during the 2019-2020 school year and was later discussed at a staff meeting on September 28, 2020. On both occasions, the idea received full support. The formal proposal was shared with staff via email on November 14, 2020, and comments were invited. Some of the comments received include, I think this is such a nice gesture. Nino deserves this and, would, and should be memorialized. My support as a staff member of the Denny South Pathway since 1992 is behind renaming SWAC after Nino. I can't imagine anyone who knew him not supporting it. Nino was also the dad of one of our amazing special ed students who worked with me many years here at SELF. This is a great idea. That would be so amazing, and I support this 100%. The written proposal was shared with Chief SELF families via school messenger on November 15, 2020. Parents were also invited to comment at the school's virtual cafe on November 19, 2020. The following is a comment from a parent and community volunteer heartily supporting, honoring Nino by naming the SWAC after him. I was lucky to have worked with Nino for many years while working. I was helping run the snack stand. Nino was great to work with, cheerful, enthusiastic, and always willing to help. He remains greatly missed. Equity analysis. This proposal is aligned with board policy 0030, ensuring educational and racial equity parts E and H. E, welcoming school environments. The district shall ensure that each school creates a welcoming school culture and inclusive environment that reflects and supports the diversity of the school district's student population, their families, and communities. H, recognizing diversity. Consistent with the state's regulations and district policy and within budgetary considerations, the district shall provide materials and assessments that reflect the diversity of students and staff, and which are geared towards the understanding and appreciation of culture, class, language, ethnicity, and other differences that contribute to the uniqueness of each student and staff member. School Board Policy 0030 was reviewed in the context of this proposal, and it, and it is believed that renaming the Southwest Athletic Complex, the Nino Cantu Southwest Athletic Com Complex, is consistent with the racial equity goals of Seattle Public Schools. By honoring Mr. Cantu in this way, a local African-American Latinx person who advocated for students, families, and communities of color, the district will promote educational and racial equity in our schools and community. Student benefits. The scholars of Denny, Chief South, and all schools in the Southwest region will see how the district celebrates and honors the great contributions of individuals within our community who constantly strive to make the lives of others more equitable and society more just. Please join our whole community in supporting the name of the Nino K2 
Cantu Southwest Athletic Complex. Thank you very much. Wow, thank you. That's amazing. I'm so sorry that we didn't um, make it in time to have your other presenter um, be here. If, if, if for some reason she comes on and, and is able to speak, um, we're happy to make space for that. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to uh, Director DeWolf, who's the chair of the Operations Committee. Thank you, President Anderson. And thank you um, to our guests tonight. Um, just as context, we had uh, we were able to have our guests from tonight actually join us at our uh, Operations Committee meeting in February, and we heard this presentation. And um, just as a uh, quick, I guess where we landed, we you know we voted unanimously to approve this, to send this up to for approval to the full board. And, and I just. Um, it, it feels at this point like it makes complete sense. This is exactly the kind of people, the kind of person really that we want to honor and memorialize as part of this district. And certainly it's a great reminder that there are many folks who, who are memorialized in this district with names on our schools who likely don't deserve that. Um, because the folks, because I think the folks like uh, Nino are at the caliber of the types of people that we always want to memorialize at Seattle Public Schools. So I am really excited about this this renaming and I don't have any questions. You had a thorough presentation and everything in the bar um, is is uh, on the up and up and I'm happy to support this. Okay, um, let's go to Director um, Rankin. I was totally ready that time. Um, uh, no, I <laughs> was uh, fortunate to be able to hear from uh tonight's presenters and a couple more people at the um operations committee meeting and i i don't have any questions i just you know there's been buzz around other districts and other you know other issues that have come up that you know with with renaming things of of people saying you know oh why are they doing that right now isn't there more important things to do and and i actually don't think that there could be um things that would take a lot of importance over um, honoring someone from our community and someone that we want to remember and remembering, um, you know, joy, even even in times when everything seems very urgent and, and emergency, there's good stuff happening too. And there's stuff that we want to hold on to and remember. And um, at the operations meeting, having having you all there was just this kind of moment of, of relief and connection. Um, and I hope that moving this forward and having the the building take the name of this person will will continue to serve as that for your community. Um, so thank you so much for being here, and I'm I can't wait to vote on this next time. Thank you, uh, Director Vera Smith. Director Vera Smith. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, my slow computer. Um. Thank you. No, definitely. We, we talked about this in committee and so happy that we to have um, other representatives there to share their stories. Thank you, Dory, for all the work you've done um, building support for this. Um, Principal Clark, I love your background. Thank you for being here tonight and uh, sharing this with us. Um, Nina sounds like an amazing person. I was so excited to honor and I also do feel this is time well spent um, despite what um, might be also on our plate. Um, we were honored to be able to do this for him and um, look forward to supporting this um, when it comes up for, for a vote. Thank you. Director Harris. Thanks so much. Thank you, Principal Smith. And um, Ms. Dory, I believe that you misidentified yourself. I don't believe you're just the lunch lady in the dock box, but I believe you are now promoted to the kitchen manager. And um, I'm thrilled by this. I can see the lights of SWAC. Hopefully soon Nino can too, SWAC from my home. I've attended well over 100 events there and hope to live long enough to uh, attend another 100. And everything that has been said about Nino Cantu is true. I knew him. But but I think part of the, the heartfelt here is we in 
the SPF family, and in so many other bureaucracies, celebrate the folks on the top of the food chain. And Nino Cantu was boots on the ground, day in, day out, again, for 20 years, cared, smiled, embraced. And I'm beyond thrilled that we are celebrating someone that doesn't have a lot of initials after their name and, and that shows up every day to hug and support and love our students. And I'm sure Superintendent Juno will be thrilled that I'm no longer harassing her on a monthly basis about the status of this. And uh, my hope is that Principal Aida Fraser Hammer can join us when this is up for action. And we can also congratulate her on her long and storied career as the principal of Chief Self International High School as she is retiring this year. Um, from my heart to everybody, I beg of you, this is the right thing to do, and this is the right time to do it. And I really appreciate Principal and Dory showing up to, to make this happen, and your communities that you reach back into and got such extraordinary support for this. Thank you. Director Dury. Um, I just want to say thank you to the presenters who came and um, had this great presentation to remember Mr. Cantu, and I look forward to seeing this in action. Director Hersey. There's nothing that I can say that hasn't already been said, so just expressing great gratitude. Um, you know, sounds like an amazing person, and I just wish I could have met them. Um, but I am happy to support this when it comes uh, before us for approval. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you so much for, for coming and, and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you all. Um, I, I think you'll have good support, it sounds like, from the um, uh, sounds of things and we'll look forward to seeing you um, when this comes forward at our next meeting for uh, action. We'll, that, we'll move on to item action item number six. Directors, from um, here on out, we have to get through um, to 15, all operations and um, so I'm going to, uh, after Chief Podesta does the presentation, I'm going to ask for any directors that have comments or questions rather than doing uh, a roll call. So please be prepared to um, raise your hand or for Director Hersey to, uh, uh, Director Harris, who's on the phone, um, to um, holler and let me know that you need to uh, make a comment or ask a question, okay? Uh, so introduction item number six, BEX 5, award contract P18939 for accessibility consulting services to Studio Pacifica for the uh, BEX 5 program. This came through ops on March 11th and was recommended for approval. Chief Podesta. Uh, thank you, President Hampson. This, again, is for consulting services for an accessibility expert for 16 construction projects that are part of the BEX 5 capital levy. And the um, the goals of this are, of course, to have maximum ac accessibility to our buildings and also to be compliant um, with the Americans with Disabilities Act, which does not actually have a permitting process, uh, unlike the building code or the electrical code. So it's good to bring in an expert with kind of that eye to review our designs, review our buildings, um, give us advice on how to make them more accessible and also to make sure that we are in compliance with the ADA. Happy to take any questions. Okay, does anyone have any comments or questions? If you're um, able to, please raise your hand. Otherwise, uh, if you're on the phone, please speak up. Director Rankin. Um, I'm really excited about this. Um, so it's for upcoming projects, not any back, back going, back, backwards looking projects. Um, in the past, has this been something that's been done, not been done? Um, done in a different way. My understanding is we've done it in selected projects or we've we relied on our um, uh, designers um, to bring uh, to bring this expertise. I'm not aware of us having done it kind of at this programmatic level across um, multiple projects and and so we'll um, 
see how you know the the effects of this i think this is a deeper level of expertise than we've had in the past and um as we talked uh this question was raised um i believe in the operations as well that um depending on our experience with this we might um add this type of service into our facility condition assessments and do you know a broader um analysis of uh, other buildings not just buildings that are under construction I, I think that's great, and I um, am really excited about having this being done proactively as part of projects as opposed to a sort of uh, afterthought and, and tacked on. So this is this is great. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Yes, Director Harris here. I was particularly excited about Chief Podesta mentioning that this might be included in our building condition surveys, and I, I sincerely hope it is. Thank you. Anything else? Going once, going twice. All right, let's move on to uh, introduction item number seven. Thank you. Um, this is the sorry let me just read it really quick this is vex 5 resolution 2020 um slash 21 21 racial imbalance analysis for van asselt school addition project this came through ops on march 11th for approval go ahead sorry chief podesta uh, uh thank you uh, president hansen um as you know projects with state funding um as part of the state funding process require us to do a uh, analysis whether the project um, changes enrollment or will have uh, either create or aggravate a racial imbalance with respect to enrollment. This particular project is a 20 classroom addition to the Van Asselt School, which we're using as an interim site um, to uh, uh, house students while other buildings are um, being either modernized or constructed. And so by definition, it doesn't really have a long-term effect on enrollment because students will only be temporarily in this edition and then we'll um, move back to their home school uh, their assigned school um, wherever it is so um, we can assert that this does not have a racial will not create a racial imbalance in the district thank you um okay any comments questions or concerns from directors Going once, going twice, going three times. All right, let's move to introduction item number eight, which is quite a lengthy item. Uh, this is Building Excellence, Bex 5 uh, School Construction Assistance Program and Distress School Grant, resolution number 2020 slash 2120, certifying the intent to construct for Kimball Elementary School replacement, Northgate Elementary School replacement, Viewlands Elementary School replacement, Lincoln High School phase two gymnasium building, Rainier Beach High School replacement, and Van Asselt Classroom and gym Gymnasium Addition Projects. This came through Ops on March 11th for approval. Chief Podesta. Thank you. Um, again, this is a requirement of state funding that um, requires that the board certify that um, these uh, uh, school construction assistant program funds and distress school grants, um, that we will uh, utilize the funds um, for the intent that they were proposed um, uh, with their original intent and just requires the board to certify that um, these funds will be used as originally planned and um, we've just put all the projects into a single uh, bar and resolution. This is a purely an administrative step. Any comments, questions or concerns from directors? Director Hanson, mine just a thank you to the state and thank you to our, our legislative uh, delegation for, for always advocating and supporting us. Okay, if there's nothing from other directors, we'll now move to introduction item number nine. This is BEX 5, Distressed School Grant and K-3 Class Size Reduction Grant, approval of budget transfer for the West Woodlands Elementary, uh, is it Woodland or Wood, have I been saying it wrong? Is it West Woodlands or West Woodland? I think, no S. I think we all say Woodlands, but I think it's Woodland. My apologies for every mistake that I have made in mispronouncing that name this for ten, some 10 years. Okay, uh, West Woodland Elementary Edition and Modernization Projects. Uh, this came through OPS on March 11th for approval. Chief Podesta. Um, 
this, uh, the West Woodland project is a classroom addition of, of 12 new classrooms and uh, an expanded uh, gym area and commons area and um, some other support spaces. The original um, budget put together for this project just created, had new furniture and finishes and equipment in the new part of, in the addition and the modernized parts of the building and expanded parts of the building. But the original furniture and fittings in the building were put in place in 1991 when the building opened and are not in very good condition. And we feel it'd be a big equity issue for students that's part of the building has um, worn out um, uh, furniture and the, the new addition has all new fittings. So um, we are transferring uh, uh, budget from other parts of the program where we have discretion from savings and other projects so um, the school can be uniformly outfitted with new furniture. Uh, any comments, questions, concerns from any directors? Director Harris here. I, I think it's very important that we update our schools between the have not schools and uh, I'm excited to see us taking a look at our schools that have not been rebuilt or additions made to. It matters where our children learn, children learn, our students learn, and, and to look at the school up the street that's brand new and shiny and, and to be working with furniture from 1991 is an embarrassment, frankly. Thank you. Anything else? Okay, thank you, Director Harris. We'll now move to introduction item number 10, BEX 5 approval of construction change order number five for the Van Nassau Elementary School at African American Academy. The school was renamed Rising Star Elementary at African American Academy after the contract had been executed with Wayne's Roofing Inc roof replacement project. This came through ops on March 11th for approval. Chief Podesta. Um, uh, thank you, President Hampson. We um, originally planned for the roof uh, work at Rising Star, which started two years ago and was meant to be completed over the summers of 2019 and 2020 as some minor repairs to some of the metal deck in the roof. And the metal deck is the metal portion of the building that, uh, that the roof sits on. And um, once those repairs were started in 2019, it became clear that that um, metal deck, which was no longer under warranty, um, had degraded much, uh, much more seriously and much in a much bigger area than had been originally expected. So we've had a couple of change orders to basically replace near about three fourths of the metal decking that makes up that roof. This is the last change order to finish this work. Um, and um, to, to complete, you know, replacing the whole system really at this school. And um, the work is nearing completion now. Anything from directors? Okay, hearing nothing. Uh, thank you, Chief Podesta. We will move now to inter introduction item number 11, BEX 5 approval of parametrics contract modification number two for the Rainier Beach High School replacement project. This came through ops on March 11th for approval. Chief uh, Podesta. Thank you. Um, this change order is uh, parametrics is our interim contract manager for the um, Rainier Beach High School replacement project. And this adds uh, a subconsultant, McClellan, McClellan Design, McClennan Design, excuse me, who has helped us think a lot about our sustainability goals and our methods and uh, materials that we use in construction to build more sustainable schools. And given um, the scope, the size and scope of the Rainier Beach High School Replacement Project, um, we think it's prudent to get extra expertise um, to make sure um, that uh, this. Uh, the, the new Rainier Beach High School, the new parts of the building that we're constructing with this replacement are really the model going forward um, for how we do sustainability construction and build um, sustainable buildings and um, are uh, really excited 
and feel that this work um, will uh, be a great first step um, to meeting the goals of um, uh, being aligned with the goals of the clean energy resolution that the board recently adopted. Thank you, Chief Podesta. Uh, directors, any comments? Questions? Director Harris here. I want to take issue with comments made in the public comment portion of the meeting by Mr. Jackins about Rainier Beach High School. Rainier Beach High School is uh, a high school that has waited far, far too long for uh, rebuild, additions, and rehabilitation. And I don't believe that the community supports his mentality that we should not move forward and modernize that school. And, and in fact, it's exactly the opposite. The community supports this. Thank you. Thank you, Director Harris. Uh, let's see, I see questions also uh, from Director DeWolf and then Director yeah, Rankin. Yeah, thanks, President Hampson. I just want to underscore that. I appreciate you bringing that up, um, Director Harris, because what's really important here is that um, people might have their own personal opinions, um, but the, the community organizing, the student organizing that took place to get to Rainier Beach High School updated, upgraded, remodeled, re reconstructed, took a lot of work and a lot of energy. And I think it's, it's frustrating when people try to discount people that are paying attention. And the other thing that I think is really important, particularly now that I'm on the chair of the operations committee is these people want us to keep these schools as they were in amber, systems that are breaking down, windows that can't keep in heat, materials that are breaking down. That's what they want us to keep for our kids. And I will reiterate what I reiterated at our BTA five levy conversation. Our buildings and our facilities are our monuments to our students young people and public education. Rainier Beach High School needs an upgrade to illustrate how much we respect, care for, and want to build a monument to our young people and their futures. And so it is misguided, it is misinformed, and it is certainly not taking into account what the actual overall community really wants, which is the reconstruction. So thank you, Director Harris, for bringing that up. Thank you, Director DeWolf. Director Rankin? Yeah, along the same vein, there there were uh, quite a few years in a row that as a community member and audience member of um, school board meetings, I saw a lot of student organization and students from Rainier Beach coming to the board, students even that knew they would graduate before there was any chance of any kind of rebuild, advocating for this for their for their community. Um, and uh, I, you know, we're here for the students. And in addition, in terms of funding, there's a sort of mis misunderstanding among some people that retrofitting or remodeling an existing building is, is a cost savings. And um, once a building is, is landmarked, the outside envelope, as it's called, um, cannot be touched. And it's not a cost savings to put modern updated um, infrastructure into a building that has outlived its efficiency and um, appropriateness as a learning environment. Um, it's not cost effective to do that. And it is in fact more cost effective to build again. And it is in this case, what the community wants and what these students really deserve. Okay, anything else from directors? Okay, thank you for those comments. Hearing nothing, uh, we will go to uh, introduction item number 12, BEX 5 resolution 2020 slash 2119, approval of general contractor uh, slash construction manager delivery method and award um, general contractor construction manager contract P5160 to Littig Construction Inc. for the Rainier Beach High School replacement project. This came through ops on March 11th for approval. Chief Podesta. Thank you. Um, again, this bar does do two things. Um, the state public works law allows uh, school districts to uh, utilize alternative public works 
um, project delivery methods and the um, general contractor construction manager method allows us to hire a single overall uh, contractor who will um, then bid out other parts of the project, but be with us from the very beginning as opposed to us um, doing a design contract with a design firm and then separate bids and con low uh, price bids with um, other construction contractors. And that method doesn't, the regular design bid build process has not served the district always well for large projects. Um, we believe the GCCM model um, works much better. We've used it on a variety of complex projects. Um, recently, um, the modernization of Lincoln High School uh, was uh, done as a GCCM and this same contractor, um, Lighted Construction, handled that work. And that really helps us um, partner with our contractors earlier and have a have an advocate as um, we move on with other contractors and sub subcontractors that will do the work. Um, so this action report, again, um, creates a resolution where we, um, the board certifies to the state that we're ready and able to manage this alternative public works method and then awards the contract um, to lighted construction and um, agrees to a guaranteed maximum price of $153 million to manage the whole project, um, construction side of the project for the replacement of Rainier Beach High School. And I'm happy to take any questions. Directors, do you have any questions, comments, or concerns? Okay, with that, we're going to move on to uh, introduction item number 13, BEX 5 award construction project P5143 to KCDA slash Musco Sport Lighting for uh, LLC for the athletic field lighting improvements in Jane Adams Middle School project. This came through OPS uh, for approval on March 11th. Chief Podesta. Um, uh, thank you. The uh, district has had a program over the uh, past few years to install field lighting at secondary schools. Um, so to support uh, student athletes and community use of fields Again, um, as we have shifted bell times to have secondary schools later in the day, we want to uh, increase access to fields to be later in the day. This is a project for James Adam, uh, Jane Adams Middle School and um, we'll construct field lighting. We've chosen through the purchasing cooperative King County Directors Association, Musco, Musco Sports Lighting, which is the only, um, the city of Seattle has um, uh, very progressive um, uh, standards for outdoor lighting um, to make uh, lighting uh, not to be intrusive with na neighbors. And the, um, we have very modern design where uh, that really focuses lighting on the field and does not cause extraneous lighting to have negative impacts on neighborhoods. Um, this vendor is the only provider that can provide um, lighting that meets the city standards um, and we're ready to proceed with this project and this contract would uh, um, award the, the construction. And I'm happy to take any questions directors might have. Okay, directors, any questions about the lighting at Jane Adams Middle School? All right, I guess that's been appropriately illuminated. Thank you, Chief Podesta. Um, we will we will now move to introduction item number 14, BEX 4, uh, BEX 5, Distress School Grant Award Construction Contract P5157, bid number B102027 to Forma Construction for the North Beach Elementary School Heating, Ventilation, Exterior Door and Seismic Improvement Project. This came through OPS on March 11th for approval. Chief Podesta. Um, this, uh, again, is a combination project um, where we make seismic improvements and structural improvements to the building and um, demolish and remove uh, materials as needed, uh, install the bracing and seismic upgrades as needed, and make um, uh, improvements to HVAC and other uh, mechanical systems in the building coinciding. It's an efficiency to do this work together um, and um, this uh, action uh, will award the contract to Forma who won it as part of a competitive process. 
Directors, any questions about this particular um, item? Okay, I think we can close the door on this one and we'll move now Actually, to- wait, sorry. Oh. And also, I noticed, your, I noticed your puns, Director. <laughs> I'm trying. I'm trying to get some people. I'm going to make you interested. The 8.30 hour. Um, I'm just curious about what the longevity is expected on these, because I know that North Beach is a school that was in uh, the so-called bubble of almost being, almost making the cut for a rebuild and not quite. Um, the you know, That's this was what, what was that? My, my comment was several times, it almost made the cut. Um, you know, that it will obviously depend on what the remaining use of the building is. Um, the, you know, these, um, are safety and, um, uh, uh, life safety issues with, um, uh, seismic improvements and also ventilation. And if uh, the North Beach project is undertaken or a major project is undertaken as, you know, part of BTA 5 planning, let's say, you know, once we get through the levy process, the planning process and the work process, you know, the, if there's a new building ultimately in North Beach, you know, that's approaching the better part of the decade. And so I, I do think the right thing to do is in the intervening years, the students, um, in that building deserve the benefit, the safety, life safety benefits of these investments. Absolutely, yes. I'm by no means advocating that we shouldn't do a seismic improvement or ventilation improvement, um, but I just kind of just wanted to acknowledge that um, this is a building that um, needs more attention it, at it, some point. You know, it was unfortunate it didn't, you know, fit into the back six levy and we'll always have these kind of shoulder projects that are between levies and we'll have to make um, interim yeah. investments, but that's the right thing to do for the students in the, in the interim years. Great, thank you. Anything else from directors? Okay, and last but not least, we will move to introduction item number 15, BEX 4 Award Construction Project P5131, bid number B102026 to Lincoln Construction, Inc. for the Washington Middle School Seismic Improvements Project. This came through OPS on March 11th for approval. Um, likewise, uh, this is not so much about HVAC, but strictly a seismic improvement project. There will be um, relocation of some architectural elements and improvements to electrical and uh, plumbing and mechanical systems. But again, this is part of our ongoing program to retrofit buildings um, to uh, for life safety purposes and to protect our assets to be more prepared in the event of a seismic event. Uh, by the way, just kidding, this is not the last item. We have two more. Uh, I somehow got 15 stuck in my head, but it's 17. Um, okay, any any shakeup on this one from directors? Hi. I'm oh my gosh, Chandra. <laughs> Jacob, <laughs> well done. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just trying to keep you entertained. Okay, <laughs> Director Director Burr Smith. Hi, yes. No, I'm Thanks. No, I we talked about this in committee and uh, mentioned how um, Washington Middle School was was on the bubble for uh, I believe Dex Five. So I, I had the question about you know we're putting this money into the, these improvements when this could end up being on our next levy and getting rebuilt. But um, you could actually speak to how it, it's something that is still investment to be made. So I don't know if you want to talk about that. How it's the importance of doing this now. When you, when you think of the overall value of all our physical plant, um, these investments, well, you know, they're not trivial with respect to how many years, how many students are going to be enjoy their benefits, even if it isn't the full life of the building, I think it still represents a wise investment. Thank you. Particularly for safety issues. Anything else?
Okay, let's move on to introduction item number 16, BEX4 final acceptance of contract P5123 with CDK Construction Services, Inc. For the Catherine Blaine Seismic Improvements Project, this came through OPS on March 11th for approval. Podesta. Again, and um, at Catherine, uh, this was a, a completed seismic improvement project that went to the board and um, the board had oversight of the um, awarding the contract. The final acceptance um, allows us to uh, release um, the project retainage with the um, accept the work as complete um, and which it was completed and release any uh, contract retainage to the vendor. Um, this and the um, intro item 17 are, are both final acceptances. Any uh, questions, comments, concerns? Okay, this school now being on a solid ground, we will move to number 17. Whoa! <laughs> <laughs> BTA4, VEX5, final acceptance of contract K5120 with Coast to Coast Turf for the athletic field improvements at Nathan Hill High School and Jane Adams Middle School project. This came through OPS on March 11th for approval. Chief Podesta. Thank you. Um, uh, we have a rotating program to um, replace athletic fields and tracks and other similar um, built environments as they reach their end of life. Uh, we completed last summer projects for uh, Hale and uh, Jane Adams and have accepted the um, installation of the fields is working as designed and we've accepted the work from the contractor and this again is our final acceptance and a reason to celebrate um, the projects are done. Okay, comments, questions, concerns about this? Just waiting for the pun. Oh, well, I, I, if hearing none, then I believe we've finally uh, run aground. Okay. <laughs> okay. I thought that was pretty good. Um, all right, thank you, Fred. I, it's just, I have to tell you um, how impressed I am at the, the level of engage, engagement that you're able to maintain in, uh, which indicates just how invested you are in these critical, critical projects. I don't mean to um, uh, make light of them, I'm just trying to, to keep us, um, take, insert some levity so we can stay awake. Um, but but your clear descriptions are always appreciated um, on all of these items. So thank you so much. Um, and with that, we are now going to move to, uh, oh wait, are we not doing, I guess we're not doing board comments tonight. Oh no, we are doing board comments. Oh, okay. Well, here we go. We're going to start with Director Hersey. <laughs> For the sake of time, I'm going to waive my comments and just say, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm trying to eat dinner at the same time, <clears throat> and just say to all of the folks that are concerned about the dual language immersion pathway at Mercer, that item is being rectified and worked on right now um, and expect updates soon. So thank you for your advocacy around that. Director Harris. Um, I will try and condense my comments, but I've got a bunch of them. First of all, thank you, President Hampson, for the levity that you've been inserting. It's much appreciated. Thank you. Uh, welcome, welcome to the jury. Uh, it, it, it's a bizarre job, but it's a meaningful one. And you will never work with better and more committed or committable people in your life. Um, I, I want to call out the good governor and the state superintendent yet again. And, um, and I'm angry about being kneecapped without warning and without an understanding of all the operational issues and the funding issues 
And I want to say again for the record, and I guess this is going to be one of those things like I used to do about the fines, that um, we used to talk about McCleary 1, and I want a McCleary 2 lawsuit, and I want a lawsuit against the state on the STARS transportation funding formula. It, it's inconsistent. It's inappropriate. It's inequitable. And uh, we are the largest school district in the state by well over a third, and it's not fair, it's not nice, and it certainly isn't equitable. Um, and with respect to that, when we're talking about equity and money, um, I will continue to advocate for a more transparent weighted staffing standard formula I understand that one of the schools in my district, the staff voted everybody but one to um, not accepting the weighted staffing standard and the budgeting issues. So stand by, I've asked that they send it directly to the school board address so everybody's on the same page. Uh, from the bottom of my heart, I thank my colleagues uh, for the generous conversation about the Nino Cantu Southwest Athletic Complex. And with any luck at all, we will be in person for the next band jam. And I'll hold a barbecue in my backyard afterwards, but it's one of the best, funnest, joyous events in this city. And it usually happens in early August. I um, already talked about my anger at Mr. Jackin's um, comments about Rainier Beach High School. Couldn't be more um, disappointed. Um, also, I'm going to cut off the rest of my comments other than if we're going to ask staff and students to go back to school, I think we as a board need to go back to the building and do what we need to do to be socially distant and hold our meeting in person at a later time so that community and families can attend and maybe have a, I know, hybrid, air quotes, of in-person testimony and uh, phone-in testimony like we've been doing for the last year. And I think we will get more out of it because we are missing the personal connection. And, and I think that we need to model that behavior if we're asking for other for folks to come back in. The last piece is, is a very sad piece, and that's that my predecessor, Marty McLaren, District 6 director and a friend, and uh, certainly we had our issues during the election, but we uh, spent time together. And uh, I well remember having tea in her home at Puget Ridge Co-op. And two days before she died, she sent me one of the most beautiful emails. And she asked me to get busy if I could to go to the legislature and get school board directors paid and to get more funding for school board and, and, and also to work on the funding issues because the legislature and the state has uh, not implemented the prototypical model. We're talking about supplementation now with the federal funds. We're being bullied and blackmailed, quite frankly, by the state superintendent, and I'm happy to Happy to say that out loud because Lord knows I have said it to his face and I consider him a friend as well. But, but our system is not working for our students. And I, uh, I will make good on that promise to her. And I'm devastated that she has left us, but I am proud of our friendship and extraordinary respect to her. Um, how can we have 
it's a social emotional emergency when this state only pays for nine school nurses and isn't paying for counselors and student support workers and and all of that and more. And yes, there are federal funds coming, but they are one time funds. Sustainability is our watchword, and, and I'm more than proud to be part of a board that is talking about sustainability and systems change, long overdue, but but a whole lot of this is a whole lot of lies, quite frankly, and, and I don't mean to be disrespectful, but um, we got to figure out a way to get our message out there. Um, and, and truly follow the money. Last, um, I'm very pleased that we passed the bars tonight for um, the transition between our superintendents. I've said it before, I'll say it again. I have extraordinary respect for Dr. Brent Jones and I will give him my very best efforts. And I'm sorry from the bottom of my heart that it didn't work out with Superintendent Juneau. But folks, let's give her props for not exercising some pretty significant contract rights and, and made a graceful compromise. And, and it needs to be said, and I thank you all, and it's an honor and a privilege. Thank you. Okay, uh, Director Rivera-Smith. Hi, thank you. Um, long night. So thank you everyone for sticking with us. Um, of course, congratulations to our newly appointed director, Erin Dury. Um, all I can say is buckle up. We have, a, we have a, lot, a lot of work ahead of us. So thank you for joining us. Um, I also want to speak a little bit um, in light of the students, parents, and educators who, who joined us tonight to speak about the proposed cuts to the dual language, uh, the Spanish immersion courses at Mercer, I can't speak directly to that situation um, without knowing more about it, um, but I do appreciate the mitigation that Superintendent Juno spoke of in her superintendent comments and that Director Hersey uh, shared that are in the works, so that's great to hear. Um, I just, I more want to speak to sort of an overarching concern there that that is perhaps at the root of um, why many of our speakers tonight feel especially troubled by the cuts. Um, and that is a, you know, a feeling of, of dismissal and disregard for our Spanish language heritage um, students. Um, and they go by many identifications. We have you know, Latino, Latina, Latinx, Hispanic, and more. Um, I believe our district uses the Hispanic categor categorization. Um, but anyway, actions like what's potentially happening at Mercer can't help but feel like an attack on our people and our culture. So this, and this is a sentiment that was shared with me by um, Estelle Ortega, the founder and executive director at El Centro de la Raza, um, who spoke of a feeling of disengagement when SPS, um, disengagement from SPS um, when it comes to the needs of our Latino students. She said, and I'll quote, so sometimes it feels like we don't exist. And our, our brown students come into our education system often with language barriers, economic disadvantages, and many other systemic inequities. Um, and I, I just look forward to um, working with community and bringing forward more conversations to increase our attention to the needs of our Hispanic students. Um, and I want to shift down, shift gears here, because um, I also want to recognize um, the loss of a light in our Lincoln High School community this past week. I'm sorry. Um, Ezra Mancini was an amazing young man, and uh, my family had the honor of being in a community with him and his family in elementary school. And um, that community is coming together uh, uh, to pour out our, our love and support for the Mancini family. We are sharing our memories um, and coming together to do what we can to support the family and just remember Ezra for all the uh, wonderful things that he brought to everyone's life. Um, I want to thank Patricia Sanders and the coordinated um, school health team for your attention and support of the Lincoln community. Um, thank you for acting so quickly there. And parents, I just want to say, please hold your children close always. 
and to the Mancini family, we hold you in our hearts. Thank you. Thank you, Director Rivera-Smith. Director Rankin. Thank you. Um, I know it's late, so I'll try to keep it concise, which for me is maybe not that concise, but I'll try. Um, I also want to uh, welcome and congratulate Director Dury, and I am really looking forward to um, working with you and, and getting to know you and um, having having another another partner on this um, wild adventure that we're all having right now. Um, uh, I want to echo something that um, Director Harris mentioned, which is is you know the the kind of what we're all dealing with right now, which is a directive from from the governor. And um, I there's been uh, I I also I want to give a just giant huge shout out and thank you to uh, staff and educators for um you know as much as families i know families are feeling like there's a new thing every day and there's there's you know a bell time change and then it's in person and then what's happening with secondary and all this stuff and um that is, is su super real and we know how real it is because that is what is we're experiencing too as as leaders and as staff people and that every time some new piece of information has come it means that whole teams of of folks who work for SPS as educators, as maintenance, as facilities, uh, you know, all as curriculum, um, every single one of those things means that um, a whole bunch of people who have been, you know, going at full steam also have to switch direction um, to whatever is coming at us next. Um, so I, I just wanted to acknowledge that because I think it's, um, it's forgotten how many how many people all of these things are affecting and impacting, and that um, you know central offices we're not just sitting around waiting for something to to happen that has just been constant, constant, constant for everybody, um, and uh, that as soon as we think we can kind of count on one thing, the rug gets pulled out from under us, and and we're going in a different direction. And um, so while I I know that there are a lot of people. Um, they're really excited and happy and cannot wait to have their kids return to buildings. A lot of teachers that cannot wait to see you, um, my kids included, are are so done with remote learning. Um, uh, however, um, the there's there's still a lot of unknowns and we're still we're still being directed to do this in a way that wasn't how we anticipated. <laughs> and so I want to acknowledge. On the one hand, that you know, I understand the frustrations of people who are waiting for a plan, waiting for a date, waiting for something to come, um, and and that honestly includes us to a lot of extent because we gave we the resolutions that we passed three different times um, said gave the same direction for the same groups of students for a gradual return, and um, and that that would have had student more students in buildings right now. Um, if if we were able to to make that happen, um, and so you know I understand the well the sense of urgency that was being felt and the directive that came down. Um, I understand to some extent, but I also think it was clearly a uh, a move of impatience and not one of of community care, and especially when. Um, uh, the district and our teachers union were, were really close to coming to agreement around um, the board's directive, uh, literally almost the same day that the governor made his announcement. Um, everybody had to immediately drop and shift gears. And so there, there are a lot of things that are not ready to go on a dime because we've been underfunded for a lot of a lot of years. And um, we don't have extra resources that we're sitting on. Everything, everybody's going at maximum. Everybody is, um, you know, uh, working long, 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 long hours. And uh, not to say there haven't been mistakes made, but just um, if it feels like new things are coming at you all the time, it's because new things are coming at us all the time. And there's a shift to try to serve as many students as equitably as we can 
in the face of, um, you know, people telling us that everybody's going back for mental health, but then saying that we have to provide predominantly content delivery um, and not focus too much on social emotional learning, which um, I actually find pretty um, offensive and upsetting, <laughs> um, to be frank. Um, so, uh, um, yeah, I, I just hold on all you can and, and we're doing our best to serve as many students as we can in the most equitable way possible in a very tight time frame. We will get through this. And um, uh, I'm, I'm now really looking forward to conversations about fall as an entire community that are not driven by deadlines from the governor and not driven by um, restrictions around bargaining for us all to come back together as a whole district, educators, families, um, staff, board, parents, students, and, um, and pivot again, <laughs> but to have a little bit more space to talk about um, what we want and how we all want to get there together. Um, and that's, that's more than enough for me. Dr. DeWolf. I said all I need to say tonight. Thanks for all of your hard work, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Director Dury. I just want to say thanks to everybody again and thanks for your vote and your vote of confidence in the words that you spoke. Um, I look forward to working with you all and digging in and learning more and uh, getting the work done. Thank you. Um, okay, uh, so uh, welcome, Director Dury, and uh, I will call you tomorrow. Um, and uh, Pina Gigi, thank you to everyone. Uh, I have my uh, uh, Thursdays in the park with um, Chandra tomorrow at 11 a.m. We'll be meeting at the community center in Magnuson Park for anyone that wants to come join and talk about what's going on in Seattle Public Schools um, or just walk and enjoy the outdoors. Um, at 11 o'clock, it's listed on Facebook. We meet at the, we're meeting at the community center at Magnuson Park uh, and you can look up the address on that um, Facebook invite or text me at 206-618-1456. I'm always happy to take uh, constituent calls and um, questions that goes for, for students as well. So um, thank you all. And there being no further business on the agenda, this meeting is adjourned at 8.57 p.m. Uh, be well. Good night, everyone.